change this morning. We'll kick off the council meeting for Thursday, the 10th of December, 20 with the care of care, and this morning that is going to be led by Councillor Rachel Smith. Thank you, I'll just uh, go straight into item two on the agenda, which is apologies. Declarations of interest will be taken as the item arrives. An apology from His Worship the Mayor. Uh, without giving too much away, we will aware that he's on surgical leave. I've spoken to him this morning and he's doing extremely well and will be back in the hot seat the minute uh, Leone lets him out of the house. <laughs> um, I think he's trying to be a challenge. But he is with us all in the heart and for it today. So I'll move that the apologies for his worship the Mayor be accepted. Can I have a seconder? <coughs> Councillor Fusich, all in favour say aye. 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 Carry. We have a very large agenda today and we have five deputations. So I've sent you all an email saying that we will be adhering to time limits and we will be abiding by standing orders. Unless you've all brought your pyjamas and your sleeping bags, I'm sure you all want to get away from here by close of business today. So we're going to kick off with our deputations. And the very first one that we have up this morning is uh, SDCA New Zealand. If I put my glasses on, I'll be able to see you. Thank you. Um, Anne Marie, you're part of this deputation? Yes, and I'm happy for Alison to talk to the your time limits. Okay. So you have 10 minutes and we're having your hands when you're ready. Thank you very much and thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I did just want to note at the beginning, um, while well, firework use is a really one health issue, so it impacts environment, human health and animal welfare. As you will be no doubt uh, unsurprised here, I will be talking directly to the animal welfare uh, impacts. The animal welfare is of fundamental importance to New Zealand society, and this is evidenced in New Zealand's world-leading legislation. In 2015, the Animal Welfare Act was amended to explicitly recognise animal sentience. This is one of the few places in the world where this has been done. And what that means is that we're required to give consideration to animals' psychological experience. New Zealanders now have a legislative responsibility, as well as a duty of care, to prevent mental suffering in animals. Fireworks, it will be uh, no news to any of you here, are known to cause significant mental suffering for animals. New Zealand has one of the highest rates of animal ownership in the world. So two thirds of New Zealand households are home to one or more pets. And anecdotally, I'm sure there will be some in this room, perhaps some of you on this council, who have first-hand experience of the distress that can be caused by fireworks. When we look to the research, we see that uh, just last year there was an article published in the New Zealand Veterinary Journal. This article um, reported that as many as 60% of pets in New Zealand are fearful and impacted negatively by fireworks. Fear-related behaviour is a strong indicator of negative welfare and mental suffering. Of these animals in this study, 65% of the dogs were considered by their owners to be very or extremely scared of fireworks. And what this means is they're showing behavioural indicators, which include shivering, trembling, cowering, hiding, uh, involuntary urination, vocalisation, and attempts to flee. And one of the outcomes of attempts to escape is that it can cause injury, or we can see animals that are become loose um, or become missing. And while I've touched on the welfare impacts of animals in our homes, I'm also aware that there are a great number of horse owners up here in the north. And horses, from the research we can see, are actually even more impacted um, by fireworks than cats and dogs. So a recent New Zealand study reported that 79% of horse owners said their horses were negatively impacted. That in fear behaviour. 
And this is particularly challenging with horses. It's not a dog you can't put it away somewhere for the night to get through and make through the best of it. So we actually see 35% of horse owners report that their horses have broken through fences. Obviously, this can cause injury, damage to property, mental suffering. But there's also potential for escaped horses to cause or be involved in motor vehicle accidents, causing uh, damage to public safety. Reports of animals being hit by cars and trying to run through fences are numerous and can result in many injuries, including lacerations, fractures, death, or the need for euthanasia. Farmed animals, too, are impacted by fireworks, although there's been less study in this area, and particularly in New Zealand, but they have similar challenges in the ability of the person in charge to protect them from harm. And a lot of the focus of the research and also of people's attention is on these animals that we interact with closely, whether those are pets, farmed animals. But we cannot overstate the negative impact that fireworks have on our wildlife. Although this area is under-researched, we do know that wild animals change their behavior in response to loud and abrupt noises. This can lead to physical injury, disruption of feeding, abandonment of young, stress and mortality, which I'm sure you can imagine are all signs of mental suffering. In particular, we know fireworks have a significant impact on birds. This results in them taking flight and flying to altitudes well above what is normal. So it can then become disoriented, exhausted, stressed and potentially injured. The noise of fireworks can also lead to nest abandonment and mortality both among ground nesting birds and those that fly. And this is of particular importance when you consider that in New Zealand, uh, Guy Fox is celebrated in the spring when our native wildlife are most vulnerable. In addition to these unintentional harms, wildlife and other animals are sometimes targeted and injured or killed deliberately with fireworks. And this is something that at SPCA is what we tend to see firsthand. Many other countries and areas of the world have moved towards strict limits or bans on the private sale and use of fireworks. So New Zealand would not be alone in this. And importantly, New Zealanders overwhelmingly support a ban. New Zealand research spanning from 2010 to 2019 have consistently shown support at rates of between 80 and 90%. I'm sure you can agree there are very few things that we have such strong consensus on as this. SPCA wants to acknowledge that we know people enjoy fireworks, and we know that New Zealanders love to celebrate special occasions, uh, including New Year's Eve, Matariki, Chinese New Year, Guy Fawkes, uh, Diwali. And I just want to state for the record our organization is 100% supportive of controlled and notified um, firework displays. And limiting firework displays to public displays with ample notification is key to ensuring that we are able to continue enjoying fireworks whilst also protecting those furry family members, those other animals we have responsibilities for, and also minimizing that period of stress for our native wildlife. So in closing, SPCA would like to see a ban on the private sale and use of fireworks due to the significant harms they cause animals. And we would welcome any opportunities to discuss this further with you. And I'd be happy to take any questions if there is time. Thank you very much. I understand that you've driven up from Auckland this morning specifically to present to us. So uh, I sincerely appreciate that that was a mammoth effort on your behalf and probably involved getting out of the at some very unseemly hour of the morning. We've got enough time for one question, but what I would like the committee chairs in the room to consider of any of the deputations that we hear this morning, that if there's something that you would like to pursue further, that we invite the present presenters to a to a, a um, committee meeting where there'll be more time to examine these issues in detail. Any, any questions? Councillor Clender. Thank you, yes, uh, thanks for that. You quoted quite a lot of research. I just wonder where we might find um, that research through our SBA, SBCA website. And I'd actually be very happy to send that directly through um, to all the members. Yes, because yeah. some of those numbers are quite challenging and it would be good to develop They just not to my question. Them. <laughs> no, absolutely. As a so, scientist yeah. myself, I always want to see the uh, raw data. So, yes, I can send that through. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, if we can get that sent through to our 
beautiful ladies in democracy service at Belmont Shore get circulated to the elected representatives of the Buckingham District Council. Thank you sincerely for your presentation. The next deputation we have this morning is a representative from Farmers Sea Change. that I've already been supplied. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go into that. I'm standing in for Jane Banfield, and her examples come from her area. Pukatiti and the waterfront at Russell have also raised the ire of many. You, who represent various communities, will know of more of them. When the public is concerned about council activity or permit, a liquor licensing or such, it is appropriate for that public to gather signatures on a petition to present as counsel to indicate widespread opposition. An example I know of is the proposal to issue an additional alcohol license in Omapare. But since Farnworth Holdings is not responsible to that public, protests relating to its proposals are, to say the least, not business as usual. We at Sea Change are suggesting, again, the council reconsider the role it has assigned to far more holding limited. We believe the public should be consulted about their reconsideration. To us, it seems that the new objectives mandated for local government, the four wellnesses, require that council revoke or change its decision, or the decision of a previous mayor, that profitability is the appropriate mission for far more holding. In my own opinion, through the way I'm able to understand Council's accounts, the size of profits from investments the Council has made in Foreign Work Holdings Limited are so minuscule compared to income from rents that no profit or loss or even income for far or, 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 and liability for Foreign Work Holdings Limited have any effect on rates. What matters is how any of Council's activities whether direct or by means of its holding company, contribute to the broad well-being of the Far North District. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Have we have some time for questions of elected members have any? No question? Thank you very much for making the journey over to Kaiko this morning. We sincerely appreciate that. Very good. The next deputation we have this morning is a representative from the Kaikaui and District Sports School to present a master plan for the redevelopment project. Morning, the Kaito. Good morning. It's nice to see that so many of you bought me chocolates, so <laughs> coming up for Christmas, so I'm not sure I should eat them all at once for him. <laughs> Yeah, first of all, I'd like to make an acknowledgement on behalf of Kaikoui District Sports School to uh, the staff of the council um, you know, for their assistance with the mahi that we do over the last year, particularly around the, um, the shovel-ready bid that Sports School 
put into central government, um, which, as you know, has resulted in a significant amount of funding being allocated for sporting redevelopment in quite an area. So I, I trust you've all been supplied with the master plan details, um, and I think there should also be a spreadsheet in there um, that speaks to some of the work that the board has been doing around looking at the sustainability of the proposed redevelopment um, in terms of operational costs. And that's really more to the point of why I'm here to, to present to the District Council today. In terms of the design, um, we've just provided that to you as a bit of an update. Um, it's, it's really a design scope at the moment. Nothing's been finalised because there's been no contracts that have uh, gone out and been awarded to architects at this stage. So I guess quickly to summarise history of sports ball, uh, it superseded, superseded the, the Lumba um, Park Management Committee, I think probably six or seven years ago, eight years ago, Mike, um, and is charged with basically promoting sport but also managing that asset of Lumba Park on behalf of the council. So historically there's been a lot of um, work done around sort of communicating with the, consulting with the community as to what they want out of Lumba Park and that sort of culminated in the uh, development of the Limbark, Limbark Park Management Reserve Plan. Um, and I think on the top of that list from the community's perspective was a new gymnasium, new, new facility, and, that, and hence that was the um, you know, reasoning behind the shovel ready application. So, you know, to be, to be open and honest, um, I was under considerable pressure as chair of that board to get something into the shovel ready project list. I thought it was undoable because we hadn't actually, we had no design plans. The how you shovel ready when you don't even have a design scope. However, um, Griffiths and Associates project managers that are working that were we had um, on board at that stage put something in and that was successful. So I think that speaks to the the powers of Minister Jones at that time in terms of being able to to transfer up that money. So um, but the other, I think, and more important, the most important piece of work that the board um, has been focused on is looking at the sustainability of this project in terms of, you know, with, you know, the operating costs going forward um, and, and maintenance costs. Obviously, you know, there's a great desire to have the best board facilities, but, you know, I know as well as you do, you know, we're in my regional councillor hat that, you know, there's only a limited amount of money that you can pull out of a community, so... That's really what I wanted to speak to you today about, is that um, Faye Freeman, she undertook the, she's produced a sustainability and, you know, and, and operational cost analysis report for our board. She's got, a, I think, probably a 20 year plus history in that, that area as a consultant. She's worked on a number of sporting facilities projects. Um, so she has, she's done some comparisons with some existing sporting facilities. I think this um, Tapuru, which is, in Auckland, Eastern Bay Sports Centre, which is again in Auckland and Waiheke Island. They're all different sports centres in their own right. They've, some of them, one of them's got a childcare centre, so there's different models as to bring in an income. But I guess to cut to the chase, um, if you have a look at the Excel spreadsheet that's there, have you, have you got that in front of you? You can see the, the significant operational costs. And you can also see that Faye Freeman, who's done this work for us, has, you know, Come up with, with a, you know a, a you know a likely source of income based on a whole lot of assumptions. We're ground testing those assumptions now with our sporting codes and, and sort of our community to sort of get a gauge at the level of commitment in terms of, of you know, use of that facility. But I think what I really want to draw the council's attention to is you know the level of operational funding that would be required from the district council to, to make this project fly. Um, I know you've got your LTP in front of you, and you know these, it's an extremely um, challenging situation to have received this funding ahead of being able. You know, the intention was always to align the project with consultation to ensure that the community, you know, could afford and support, you know, a new development such as this. So. I guess that's why I'm really here today is to signal that, you know, without that support by the council and, and the support from the community, I, I, there'll be some real challenges in an operating facility that, you know, we've 
we're looking at building. <coughs> so, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. We've got time for a few questions. Um, when will the project, two questions, when will the project be finished? Well, it, it's, it's 2022 is, is a milestone that we've got with MB at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, as I understand it, this bridge shows a shortfall once the building is completed. Oh, I think the shortfall that you're referring to is is depreciation costs yeah. and ongoing maintenance. Yeah. And that's that's something that, again, I wanted to, to, to put in front of the councillors. You know, we, we really need some answers to that. Uh, moving forward in terms of dialogue between Kaikoura District Sportsville and the Council. You know, there's issues around the ground lease for the new build. There's, there's what to do with the old pavilion. Initially, um, the signal we got from the Council was you've got to, you've got to demolish that old building because there's no way the Council can afford to... And I agree, I, I agree with that. You know, the community probably can't afford to have two, you know, two, two, two facilities, but... The advice we've got is that you know it's a solid old building. Given the cost of demolishing it, we could give it a birthday, and then you know the, the thoughts from Sportsville is you know the council could sell it to us for a dollar. That's one option, and, and we can absolve the council of any future uh, financial costs associated with that. It, it does serve an important purpose where it is. It provides the changing facilities for hockey and netball. Uh, immediately around, the, around that area of the park, uh, and you'll see where the proposed new building is located. It doesn't work so well in terms of servicing hockey and netball. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just um, very mindful of time, we've got two minutes. I've just asked the Chief Executive that we will be receiving a formal paper to Council, and we will be. So you don't have to have all your questions on the table today. Or we'd like to have you back. I think we need more time. Oh, yeah, I'd, I certainly That's suggest the workshop setting and we can present the full Faye Freeman Sustainability Report, which would probably take about 20 minutes. The Council will probably have a hand up, and then I think we're going to be out of time. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Justin. And so, Clarify, it was 23, 24, that the operational costs would can. And... I was just highlighting as well that um, this is not an unusual um, proposal. It's not um, just unique to Kaikui. Kaikui has done similar things, and you're welcome to come to take you to the Sports Hub meeting. Um, that includes a pool, but it includes a lot of these um, facilities as well that you're including. Yeah, and I mean, we've, we've certainly given um, ARCO a strong brief from the beginning that the design has got to be as multi-purpose as possible and designed in a way that minimises the operational costs and allows us to draw in as much revenue as possible. There's challenges in that space, as you know, with the Reserves Act, what, what we can and can't do on them. You know, we can't build a, a cafe down there, for example, uh, well, as far as I know. So, you know, there's certain, but we, we've certainly applied our minds to those issues of, of trying to make this financially sound as possible. So. So thank you. We are now out of time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to Council Rachel Smith and put a hand up so you know which one she is. She's the Chair of Strategy. What we will do is we will be able to through the Chief Executive of the Chiefs Act to have a, a considerable chunk of our time and attention. Um, and we will work through this in more detail with you. And thank you very much for making this available this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Our next deputation this morning is Diane Maxwell. There's no stranger to this room, so come on forward, Diane. And she is going to speak to us in regarding our proposal of the Peterson Motors Building and Commentary. We will email a 10 pager in relation to this um, pitch that we're going to hear this morning, so hopefully you've all had an opportunity to read that. And we'll start the clock. Good morning. Yeah, all right, to all my old mates. Some, I mean, long-term mates. <laughs> um, and uh, some new ones. Um, I'm here as the chairman of the Far North Resilient Communities Charitable Trust. And um, I just want to talk about a exciting new um, project that we've got to reinvigorate the township of Kaiko. Now, as you know, the... I mean, even though there's a lot of great things happening in Kaikoui, the, the township is dead. And this is happening worldwide. 
excuse me. Um, and unless, you know, retail is, is really had its day, unless you're somebody like non leaning or the warehouse that doesn't fit in these excuse me, little shops in Kaikau. So there has to be an alternative use for it, apart from people living in shops, which is not suitable either. So we have to come up with a plan that's um, something that's unique and interesting and will reinvigorate the whole town. And I just want, Aisha, if you could put that video on, the little video that there's a, a video of a project that um, this is modelled on, and it's in Sweden. And um, when I showed this video to Bjorn Spritzer, who is the head of domestic tourism in New Zealand, who came up to stay, I put it in the email. Um, sorry, um, it's just a short video, it's 1.2 minutes, and it just, sorry, Aisha. Yeah, it was in the email I sent this morning with a link. Um, it um, just explains everything. The only thing to remember is in this video, it talks about a mall. The concept that we have is a whole town. Oh, thanks for that. Um, and the only thing in this video, when you watch it, if we can get it. Um, Sorry, did you send it to me or to the government? To governments, yeah. Um, the only difference between this video and us is that we won't be having a restaurant and conference facilities in it. Um, we will have other add-ons that the Swedish project doesn't have. And one of them, I don't know if any of you watch um, Repair Shop on Friday nights. Um, fantastic project about um, you know, repairing and recycling. And so we will have a concept like that. I've got a... Sorry, it's gone to the jack box. We're just pulling it up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there yeah. um, There's no Freudian message in that. No. What's that? There's no Freudian message in that. <laughs> <laughs> As you get older, you tend to, yeah, things get junked a bit. More than just messages. I can come and find it for you if you want. Do you want me to come? I've just got it now. Oh, okay, cool. Sorry about that. I should have talked to you earlier too, Asha, just to make sure that you had it sorted. All right, Kate, you can pull it on the screen now and share it with watching the YouTube link as well. Okay. They say a picture tells a thousand words. This video is a perfect small demonstration of what this project will be like. But just remember, it will be a town, not a just a mall. And it will take time to, to cover the whole town, but just one by one. We have 14 empty shops now. an important part of the whole concept about you know people learning and opportunities for upskilling. So that's basically a, a bit of what it is. Sorry about the sound. Um, but um, basically it's it's an area where people can bring all the unwanted stuff. I've been talking to um, a number of our guests at Left Bank um, for uh, about the concept, and a number of people from Auckland are saying, 
tell me when it starts. I've got heaps of stuff to bring up and, you know, we'll come up. It's a, it's a, it's another opportunity to do something in Kaiko, we will say. You know, I'm meaning to do the cycle trail. Oh, we'll come and do that too. Born Stritcher was very excited about it and Tourism New Zealand have offered this whatever help we can, you know, we need um, because they said it gives us something unique and different. Um, in New Zealand. So I have sent a pack um, that Asha, do you have that, Asha? Um, some information that was on the same email. But this one? Yes, yeah, and a cover letter, yeah. So there's more information on that. Um, I have been around town during the day if you, need, if you want to, or often most days. If anybody wants to ask questions, I'm happy to. Um, talk more about it to you. So, thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. We've got a couple of minutes, so we'll take some questions. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. I wanted to skip through it because I know you guys are busy. Uh, thank you, thank you Guy. Um, we're doing some of those questions in Kaitai about um, revitalisation and um, Andy Knock. Um, who's done a considerable amount of work in Kawakawa um, recently um, is a really good contact. Um, and you're right, this is a, not a common thing. Um, it's throughout the world of big box developments. And the district plan, which controls land use development, is occurring um, this coming year. So obviously, you see, look at how those controls um, re reflect and result in different outcomes for town centres as well. Yeah. Cool. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, we had, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so within the Kaikui precinct, something like this happening would be wonderful. I agree. Does it matter where exactly? Where exactly? The, the hub building is the really important component um, because you have to have something that's suitable. And we've identified the Peterson building as a suitable one. I've mentioned that I understand you might have long-term plans for that. That's okay because we could do it short-term, which would allow us to get on our feet and then build a purpose <laughs> building somewhere. So that's okay. Or we would be interested long-term as well. Um, so it, the, the initial building is the important factor. Um, we do have a plan B, um, unfortunately, it's not in the far north, but you know, but it's <coughs> work done is not going to go to waste. Does it need to be in Main time? Street? I mean, sorry. We have time for one more question, sorry. and that's Councilor Smith. Give me the alternative. Oh, I've got a note here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was at the, the meeting, mm. the initial meeting for the town meeting you proposed this. Mm. That meeting was picked out by the town. And I just wanted to know that um, you, you called on um, Kaikohe residents to approach you if they wanted to be a part of it. Did you have a really good um, buy-in? Um, as you know, at that meeting, I said I'm not interested in just talking committees. It's working committees. So if you're not interested in doing hard work, don't bother to put your name down. Just put your name on that. The list that wants to be kept informed. I had 27 people put up their names for working committees, and some of those working committees are already meeting. Um, not all of them can because there's nothing to do yet, but there's more information in, in here about that. So there's a, a, a great um, variety of people, and also. So I've had approaches, because people have started talking about it, from Coromandel, Auckland and Rotorua, from people wanting to come up here to open one of these shops. So I want it for locals, so <laughs> it's nice to know that the word's getting out there and it's, people are enthusiastic. Actually, I just had one from Auckland yesterday wanting to do so. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Asha, and for making yourself available this morning. Thank you. Happy to see you again. Thank you. Nice to see you all guys again, too. Nobody wants to do that drink again, I'm sure. I'll put it over here. Oh. And we have one more deputation to Council this morning, and that is in relation to item 6.1 of your agenda. And this is the uh, leak of the Lost Reserve. Is it to me? Who's going to speak first? Good morning, welcome. Hi, Tina Kukdom. Tina Kukdom. Uh, 
Ranat i dori i mërë tim nejo më nërë kam një hira. Hojnë e tene i të tua ke kiru i ki mërë i a koutu. Te hatu i të matëu koutu papa, a hej tëtë të ko më matëu i të të hukja më. My name is Ifu Absalom, born in Britain, Tokyo. I have uh, returned to live on our, my ancestral land. I am a retired secondary school teacher after four decades in the profession, head of faculty in middle management. Um, education is my passion. Māori education is my pledge. Firstly, I wish to thank all current councillors, including Mayor John Carter, for your perpetual support of our efforts in acquiring the Rowan campus uh, for community education and training as a community education and training facility run by Hokianga community and helping in Hokianga. Your support subscribes to a very good relationship of Fananga Tanga with us, Te Māhure Hure, Tangata Kūriwa of Rauru, along with 14 other Hapuwa Hokiana and other Hokiana communities. We, Jimmy and I, are the founding couple of the Te Puna of Kupenuku uh, Society uh, in looking at, in acquiring the uh, campus. We began, we began this journey around three years ago, negotiating with North Tech and with Council that has brought us to this meeting today to speak on the lease on the camp, uh, for the lease on the campus. I am aware that you are not too familiar with what is fully planned for the campus, and I am here to explain to you what we have for our Māori communities. We do have our Hokianga Kwekohe Hokianga Councillors here who have been supportive all the way through. Tēnā koe tion, koro ko muko, tēnā koe ulua. And for others uh, who choose Mātauranga Māi, this is a quick overview of what is possible. The Wānanga o Hokianga is going to be the provider of the Mātauranga uh, to include education, learning, and training that will meet Hapu aspirations and uh, for their people. The Wananga will operate from the campus and will be in for the, la for the long haul. I am available to discuss this with anyone who are interested in knowing more. Uh, what I'm doing today is giving some really sensitive information. Um, to the development of the one In the second semester of 2021, we will be offering training in buildings, in carpentry. Now, this is going to uh, support Hapu aspirations and in relieving a lot of the homelessness in Hapu. And, and then I doubt whether you all realize just how big an issue we are facing in Taitokero, and especially in the rural areas. Um, the course, this course is ready to run, and this, uh, this will take them or move them to certification. Uh, the course will cover level one and possibly parts of level two, which is achievable in six months, and will move the trainees on to apprenticeships. We have a trust and we'll have a number of carpenters who will take on the apprenticeships, uh, the apprentices. And this then will move them on to building whare. Uh, and there are ways and means of doing this to be placed on whānau land, hapu, papakainga, uh, and we, are, we do have the land. And this is what this is about. Now, the Building Trust will have that group of builders, um, and we are also very aware that Kaumatu and Kuya now are living out of their cars. They've come out of Auckland, they couldn't pay their, their rents, 
uh, and they have not talked with their fund. Now, this is the, the reality we are facing now. Uh, they do have lands, and they do, and they are living on their lands at the moment. Uh, and we need this because we are. This is critical for Huff and fun. Uh, this is uh, this will lead to economic growth. Um, and this, like I said, is sensitive information at the moment. Now, all of them want their people trained. These are the aspirations that I get every time I move around the area. They want their, their people's upskill. The people, our brain actually is way out there. Uh, we have brought back some of the brain, but the other brain is out there. So we have a, a, a sort of a problem uh, with the brain of, especially of uh, in the semester, In semester one, 2021, which is probably March, um, February, March, we will be running a Maramatapa course uh, at the campus. So it's just from one extreme to another. So we, and in between, there'll be much, much more that we could do, uh, like train electricians. We need those. We need to train electricians. We need to train uh, plumbers. We need to train painters. We need to train all those things, that, those people. That goes in with the building program. And we have the means to do this with the Ngāpuhi, especially with the Ngāpuhi, um, Claims uh, we have five areas in Hokiama, five groupings who are now writing their own mandates and it's re recognized by the government. And we would expect them to contribute to the education of their people. Now, COVID-19 has also highlighted the need for people to take action and control their well-being. I have been invited to write a horticulture course in Mataranga Mau uh, to certification, possibly to degree. So, although I have retired, it's only from teaching. That's all. They wouldn't allow me to retire fully. One day, maybe. Now, what is, what's happening um, now is Fano are offering two to three acres of land for this to occur, there is a collective now uh, pulling together. Uh, we have we have a machinery for horticulture, for market gardens and things like that. Um, and Fano now are contributing two to three acres of land uh, for this to happen. So this is quite the, the, the and this also leads to economic growth. Uh, Actually, this is what I call Ramatira. Uh, we will be writing a course, uh, and again, with the partner, we are with the, uh, the uh, one and we partner, we are partnering up with, uh, we'll be writing a course for agriculture, also with Matarama Mai. We need to train many, many more things. I mean, the possibilities are endless, so long as it's uh, planned right. We are looking at a five-year plan uh, to ensure that these courses are running and then people are moving on into uh, apprenticeships, uh, into other areas of uh, development for the Hapu and Gapuhi, particularly. So, like I said, we are looking at a five-year window to get the training up and running. All courses are sustainable. That will lead to economic growth. Doing it. Thank you. And lastly, should, uh, this should give you an indication of the length of lease needed for the future of Hapu-based Wanama in Hokiama for everyone, including Hapu outside of Hokiama. Yeah. I'll be happy to take questions later. Uh, all the councillors uh, of Hokiama uh, could meet with me later and. And discuss this further. Kia ora, my Kia ora, I just want to speak directly to the lease and to the organisation. The PU has given you the vision of what allowing the Hokianga community to take over an abandoned campus, which is of no value to the Whānau District Council. Um, she's given you the 
her passion and her ideas about what that could mean for our people. As you can see, I'm not Māori, I'm not from Hapu, but I, have worked, at, I worked for North Tech for 20 years. We did not deliver what was needed. One organisation like that can't do it. But our, our society, and we've got Diana from the North Side here and Janet from Rawani, we have a number of organisations involved in this. But the long-term passion is to provide education using a facility that originally belonged our people, which was originally set up through a PEP scheme from the, from the Hokianga County Council. You'll have in front of you the Mayor's letter of support. He was the county clerk at the time and made that happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think we also, Malam has also got some pictures of people, the community coming out and cleaning up, um, being supportive, running a festival day there, and um, it's, it, it shows you that people really care. That's our very opening day. I'm going with, to have to call it. Yeah, I know. What I'm trying to say is, is we will that be debating, the delivery is one we thing, will be but debating this is item six point one immediately after the minutes. Yeah. So I'd like to invite you to stay, and we might call you back to speak further when the agenda item is presented Excellent. to council. Thank so you. I'm not cutting you dead now. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's okay. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for that. That brings me to the deputations that we've had this morning, and I'll just reiterate, if any of the committee chairs this morning heard something that they would like to pursue further through their committee, please make contact through the CEO's office and the multiple services to schedule that to happen. We'll move on to mural announcements, and of course I'm not the mayor, I'm just pulling in the job, so I don't have any. Um, but I'd just like to acknowledge and welcome to the meeting today members from the Kaikaui Hokian Community Board, Emma, okay. Louie, and from the Bay of Islands Pongaroa Community Board, Frank. Thank you. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we have Janice sitting here today at the table. Uh, Will is on leave today, and uh, she's much more attractive than Will will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely to have you here. Finally, I just probably not politically correct to say that, but I'm 58, I can get away with these things. I just like to um, just to acknowledge that this is the last council meeting of the year, and it has been an incredible year with COVID. Uh, we're changing the way council did business with PGF, ECO, and all of those funding streams that came at us out of left field. Our staff have burnt the midnight oil and they are a credit to the Farmers District Council and I am incredibly proud of each and every single one of you. I don't get the opportunity to tell that to 300 odd people, but I do get the opportunity to tell that to those of you that are in the And I see that a secret Santa has been. I'm not sure that there's 350 chocolates collectively in those boxes. But I would encourage you all to, to share your secret Santa gifts um, as a very small way of just saying thank you for who you are and for what you do every single day. And I'd just like for everybody just to have a wee clap for the start. to confirmation of minutes, which is item 5.1 in your agenda. The recommendation is on page 10. I will move the recommendation. Can I have a second, please? Thank you, Councillor Stratford. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any grammatical errors, errors of fact, misstatement that need to be corrected? If not, thank you. Right, stay. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against no. The next item of business on the agenda today is item 6.1, which is the Rawani lease. There is a recommendation in the agenda on page 20 for the purposes of the debate. I will move the recommendation. Can I have a second of this? Thank you, Councillor Bessage. It has been moved and seconded. The author of the report is Kay Rekin. Kay here. Yes. 
Yeah. I'd just like to ask you if there's any um, ancillary uh, matters at the start I'd like to bring to our attention before we start the debate. No? Okay, I'll hand it over to Councillor Bethlitz. Yeah, I just want to, um, there's a note in there, so this is not my comment, that the Kaikei Community Board, which was speaking yesterday, uh, and there's the outcome, and I'm just thinking that maybe first up we can hear what the outcome was. The outcome from the Kaikou Hukia Community Board meeting today. Yes, it says, it, it says it will be presented. Okay. Mr Edmund, would you like to speak to this? Oh, look, um, we made the, the Community Board um, underdone about the wording of their, their resolution. The first one suggested was we want this to happen, we really, really want this to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we voted down in favour of some more legal uh, legal ease uh, like this. Um, but there was also a subject, a, a, an amendment or addition to it um, that the community board was deeply disappointed um, that the delegations in this respect weren't considered by council uh, as they were required to do under section schedule segment of the Local Government Act. Um, and we just wanted to make that public. Um, at the point that we asked for these allegations uh, almost a year ago now, and nothing was ever done, but no, no consideration was made, so I wish I'd leave it, leave it there. But we really want to say thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Councillor Yeah, thank you, Madam no, Chief. Um, I, as we mentioned, uh, and, and I certainly agree that there is an urgency around doing this, understand, um, and you may have to ask um, if we were to need to speak. But we heard, for example, just how expensive the vision is and how much work's gone and, and how many providers there are out there wanting to start. But they can't start until there is actually a lease. It was promised in November. It still hasn't happened. So I just want to stress the urgency that we must move and otherwise we're going to lose this period, which is crucial for them to do the necessary work so that the training can start um, on time in the new year as they have planned. So I certainly support it, um, uh, Madam uh, Chair, and um, to be more tomorrow. Thank you. It's now over to the floor. We'll go to Councillor Tepanea. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to, I would like some advice if I may, and um, I'm still learning standing orders. I, I'd like to foreshadow an amendment. Um, and that would be around, we've heard uh, about the, the plan, there's a five-year plan to the site. So I would like to foreshadow an amendment that we increase the term of the lease to five years, or if we could have some comment from staff about how that could potentially work. It's currently three years for the right of renewal for three years, or is there any way we could capture this? I would um, hate for us to not give, if uh, we've got a five-year plan, we want to give them five years Okay, so before I ask the staff for that, while you've got the floor, are there any other matters that you'd like to raise? Just yeah, I'm absolutely um, in support of this. Um, we've seen a, a, a little bit of a fuck up in this report of this, that this group, which has become to Punaka Penapu, has been since 2013 working on this thing in 2017, it's now 2020. We always talk about um, empowering our locals to actually do things for our communities and the way comes we can do that. So. Thank you. So, Mr Finch, as the authorizer of this report, Mr Tiffany has foreshadowed an amendment to the length of the lease to five years. Are you able to comment on it? Through the Chair, um, as has been identified, the recommendation as an initial term of lease for three years, which I believe is standard with our leases, and the right of renewal, which um, potentially gives the total lease term up to six years. And the, 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 um, so I was advised by Ken Ross and myself, which I Could you come up to the podium, please? Sorry. The reason is that we are being live streamed, and the next thing is that you're on camera. Um, so I've been advised by Ken Ross, a staff member, that it was agreed at some meeting that the uh, trust thought that three years, initial three years, to find the feet, see how things are working, and then a look at further three years, gives them a total of six years to establish themselves. And um, is there any reason why it could not be set at five years? 
No, not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm not a decision maker on it. <laughs> I had been given the impression, and Janine may be able to qualify this, um, that three years was what they initially asked for at some meeting at some point. Thank you. But yes, um, we, we um, I'll just as an aside, um, we do do five plus five. Lisa, so five years before, right, five years before. Could you just stay here for a minute and I ask Janine to come and stand behind you so she's also on camera. Yeah. Um, would you like to add comment with regard to the term of the link? Well, I think the three plus three is because we thought that was we were being modest. It was a bit like it was a bit like um, asking asking for something and the hope you'll get something. Um, Councillor Tapania has picked up the fact that we really seriously are looking at the long term in five years. If you're talking with an organisation um, like those, those tertiary institutions, which are the ones that are going to bring in the long term income to make it self-sufficient? It's not going to be self-sufficient in the first year or so, or two years, but over five years it will become its own social enterprise. And so thank you. Um, if we can be given five years with the right of renewal for five, that would be brilliant. And it would also give um, certainty to the providers we'll be looking at for coming in and offering courses. Thank you. I'll just thank you. Up. You can stay there. I'm just going to check with my chief executive if you'd like to make comment on the five years. No, that would, um, I'm looking to start taking their advice. It seems, it seems absolutely fine. So as the mover of the motion, I will be prepared to entertain an amendment to five years, Councillor Beasley. Thank you. We can have a say. Thank you. Sure. So I also hear Councillor Clendon. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just to speak in support of it, it's a classic no-brainer. We have a an underutilised resource, which is deteriorating through lack of use. We have a screaming need for education on intervencies. And a bunch of people with a ton of energy willing to join those dots. So congratulations on the proposal. Um, I was interested in both of his comments about the employment and training opportunity that he announced here a couple of days ago. We got a report that showed that post-COVID employment has remained reasonably stable in Auckland, except for young people in this group. And um, we've got this big um, unexploded landmine called yeah. youth unemployment. Yeah. We need to address that. And what better than by giving them education training in an area where we desperately need um, those courses of train builders, plumbers, all those good practical skills. So, yeah, thanks for bringing this. It's nice to support something so positive and forward looking. And we're also proud of Thank you, Councillor Madam Chair, um, none of you know for your presentation today. Um, I um, wanted to speak in support of the proposal and highlight that there's been really great collaboration efforts between Te Rarua and North Tech and Kaitaia through the building of 10 square metre cabins, um, and those at Whakapapa to Te Rarua um, are able to have that for a weekly payment, and that is addressing the homeless. Um, situation which is extreme and is going to get worse before it gets better. Um, and I welcome the um, central government changes for the 110 square metre pole sheds um, and the 30 square metre um, cabins, which we can now increase to. And I would really love to see that happening and for those cabins and pole sheds to be established on the Fenua and in the Hokiana. And um, thank you for <coughs> yourselves and the work group because this wouldn't have happened without you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor Forrest. Standing orders provide that once three members have spoken in support of an amendment, a motion, that I can put the motion. I have. Councillor Smith and Councillor Collar have signalled that they wish to speak, but at this point I'm going to ask if anyone wishes to speak against the motion. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, point questions, not statements. This is five plus five. Good to get So as a mover of the motion, I said that I would be prepared to entertain an amendment to five years. So I'm going to move that now. Five year lease plus five. Five year lease. Plus five year five review five. Plus five. Yep. That's been uh, moved by me, seconded by Councillor Fusich. I've now opened the floor again. Does anybody have any matters that they wish to raise in relation to the amendment? Yes. Councillor Stratford. Thank you. I just um, want
want to acknowledge the Kaikui Kukianga Community Board for their advocacy on this and check in with um, Chair Mike Edmonds. Um, are you in support of the five years plus five? At, as, and the rest of the board can, yeah, they're nodding. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, awesome, cool, thank you. And, and also your um, putia that the board has put into the um, project. Well done, awesome. Really want to acknowledge that. Yes. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will now have four people speak in favour of the motion. I will shortly be putting up, but before I do, Councillor Tiffany, did that answer your concern? Oh, I'm, I'm really um, aesthetic, is that the word? <laughs> I try and use these thing, big English words that I read, but I don't know how to say them. <laughs> ecstatic. Yeah, I'm a, very ecstatic. Do you have a question, Councillor Smith? Uh, I actually just have uh, a point of clarification around the Edmunds comments around the delegation, uh, and I would like to ask for advice as to whether or not it would be reasonable for us as Council to request a report for us to consider in terms of the delegation of this facility as next steps. I thank you, Councillor Smith. The matter of the delegations is a matter that will be discussed later on in the agenda at find it, item 6.9, um, and I will speak further about that at that point in time. So the substantive motion at the moment is item 6.1. The recommendation has been um, moved by me with an amendment to 5 plus 5, seconded by Councillor Gersich. I now have five councillors who have spoken in support of the motion. I will put it all over and say aye. Oh, and okay. against no. Gary, thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So 
I, I would hope that they'll keep going to the boards whether they have to or not. Thank you. Thank you. I will now put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Item 6, page 39 of the Regina Joint Local Authority Climate Change Committee Agreement and Appointment of Members. The recommendation actually commences on page 40. I will move it for the purposes of the debate. Can I have a seconder, please? This is Councillor Seconder. Yes. Ms. Gavin, Ms. Gavin. No, she just popped out. Not here. Does staff member wish to add to the report? No, I'll take it as read. Councillor Schwartz. I note that this item has already been through the strategy committee at the committee meeting last week. I'd just like to draw attention to points E and F in the recommendation and note that under the strategy committee terms of reference, a recommendation to council for development of policy is not required uh, and that it could just be noted as a part of the resolution. So I just wanted to take that for your consideration. Uh, otherwise, fully support and look forward to getting this amazing money underway finally. Kia ora. Thank you. I just asked the Chief Executive to comment on that. I'm not sure if you caught that as you were between doors and seats. Uh, Councillor Smith has brought our attention to recommendation E. Yeah, well, I'll just allow you to read that, Councillor Smith. Uh, so points E and F uh, is recommending to Council under the strategy committee terms of reference. We're not required to recommend to Council for policy development. We have the delegation to be able to do that. So I would prefer that that's a note as, a, as opposed to a part of the resolution. Can we get some guidance on that? You've got advice that I haven't got. I've got no objection to that. If, uh, <laughs> are you confident enough that we're not going to come I'm confident in? enough and I haven't checked all democracy services. Please, thank you. So are you seeking Councillor Smith amendment that it is A to D and E and F become notes? Would you yes, say? thank you, Madam Chair. I, I noticed that they are recommendations and requests, but you can adjust them anyway, like, of course. They're, they're not I would prefer that they were removed from the resolution and just noted. So as a mover, I'm happy to entertain that, Councillor Tiffany. Seconder, right. So I will move that amendment. Councillor Tiffany, I'll second that amendment. Is there any further questions or debate? If not, I'll put it. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against no. It becomes a substantive motion. I'll put it again. All those in favour say aye. All those against no. Carry. Madam Chair, just as a point um, of note, if you can get the resolutions up on the screen as we're voting, that would be great. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is item 6.4, Carter Street Beach Access. I will move the recommendation for the purposes of the debate. Can I have a second, please? Councillor Smith. 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 Councill
there, that has been repeated a number of times and as highlighted at the site list that the erosion of the entrance is due to urban stormwater, not actually from the river, but um, complicates things due to its uh, proximity to the coastal marine area. Um, I note uh, under E that um, the planning assessment to consider the need for resource consent will be done. Um, that wording doesn't allow for design into the permitted baseline to avoid resource consent as part of the, uh, the design. And I would hope that the consultants would take that into account instead of designing it and then checking that it needs to um, be consent. But um, at an operational level, I'm sure that the staff will be asking those types of questions. Um, we have had feedback from the community, um, particularly those that use that on a daily basis um, for their um, income, such as commercial fishermen, um, stack collectors. Um, the beach is not just a means of access um, for resilience, but also a means of income for our whānau in Ahipara. And I do see that under the notes public consultation and public meetings is not part of the notes. Uh, can we have feedback from staff that meetings um, will be held or at least a public meeting prior to the commencement of any works and progressing with any of the options before um, anything is progressed? To the Chair, that would be a, a natural expectation of any Commission to find a long-term solution. Thank you. Um, and it's now open to the board council. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm speaking against this motion. I don't question that there is a problem that needs to be resolved, but I think $150,000 simply to identify options seems an extraordinary amount of money to me, given the scope of work that's described here. Um, identifying different locations, that would seem to me to be something that people of local knowledge might do, community board members assisted perhaps by a planner or an engineer. Um, we understand, I think, very well the nature of the problem. Stormwater coming down the street, water across the beach, washing away sand. I fail to understand, um, given that the, there is no investigation required to identify what's causing the problem, it's simply some solutions. $150,000, I mean, thinking in simplistic terms, a sort of a medium level planner or, or engineer on $120,000 salary a year, that's a year's work plus $30,000 worth of running costs, if you like, expenses along the way. I just can't fathom how $150,000 could be spent on such a modest um, scope of work to determine whether or not a resource consent is required for a particular site. The default position working in the city of Maine is yes, most likely you will need a resource consent. I'm sure a morning spent with um, planning people from NRC would identify on a number of sites the likelihood with a reasonably high measure of accuracy or expectation whether or not a consent would be required. We're not talking rocket science here, and I just think the project's a good one. We need to, to find a long-term solution. I acknowledge that. But 150k at a time when we're slicing and dicing and arguing about 30 grand a year and 50,000 there to, to commit that much money to what I think is a, a really fairly straightforward, not a very demanding task, just seems unreasonable. So I would be looking for a much, much smaller dollar figure to be attached to that, that project. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McClendon. Mr. Punch, can you respond, please? Through, through the Chair, um, I, I understand where the Councillor's comments are coming from. Um, I put a number in there that reflects um, a, a top-line estimate of what the cost of this work will be, because one thing I really haven't given is a lot of... Um, there hasn't been a lot of scoping around um, that activity at this time. It will be absorbed within my existing professional fee budget, so it's not as though we're asking you to provide more money, it's just taking some additional um, demand upon a existing budget. Um, in terms of the cost of activity, then quite clearly, we've just spoken a few minutes ago around the cost of 
consultation with communities. Um, that all comes with a significant price tag. Um, and for example, we um, just had some costings around on another matter of um, consultants um, uh, doing some work elsewhere in the area that a single site meeting would cost around about $7,000 to attend and support uh, with communities. So uh, this stuff is not cheap um, and to do thoroughly and properly. Um, what I just want to provide a top line estimate um, would endeavour to bring the project in the low cost, um, but just to not have to come back and ask you uh, at a later date that there's additional funds. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Uh, Councillor Clinton, that your No, frankly, again, that commentary about um, public consultation, for example. You don't need to consult the public in order to scope out some options, which has always been proposed in this um, in the document we have. It's certainly to progress that particular idea, then you need to engage with the public views on it, obviously. But the scope of work described here doesn't engage that. It simply gets us to a point of saying, well, there's two or three locations potentially to move to. There won't be 50, there will be two or three, I suspect. And there are a limited number of solutions to Carcass Street to do around drainage. We heard from the chap who presented to us on the site a, a broad brush sense of what could be done basically to management of school water. Again, I cannot see $150,000 worth of consultancy to achieve those rentals. Thank you, Councillor Sandin. Councillor Collard. I too uh, support what um, uh, Councillor Sandin has said. I, I find the, the amount of money. Uh, extreme. However, I do recognise that if we uh, get to a stage where we have no options, we, we may well do that. Um, whether it be the other options be uh, by public consultation or selected consultation with people that know and live out there and qualified people at that, um, it's, it's critical that we go there first. It's for any any start anyway. Yeah, you know, there's this, uh, there is an example which I was just talking with Councillor Arch about earlier on of um, Shipwreck Bay has similar problems with the river and the access to the beach being similar with the river right beside the access washed it out. They've made some changes there and it's been quite awesome. And that's onto the open beach. So there is uh, consultation. There are alternatives. Um, and as, uh, again, the Council of said, if we can control the stormwater, a lot of that problem will be gone. And I don't think that that is rocket science. Thank you, Council McCullough. Um, look, I, I appreciate where Dave is coming from. Um, we'll look at the cost, of, the cost of this, but I also really appreciate where Andy's coming from, the cost of consultation and so forth. And while I guess the way I'm coming from is in our community board, and we get the the blunt end of the or the the brunt of the community coming to us and saying you didn't consult, you didn't consult, you didn't ask us. And quite honestly, we sit back, we roll our eyes, and whenever we've gone, we say that's what they that's what they elect the elected members for, right? I mean, you know, not not everything has to be consulted on, not every tiny decision needs to be consulted on. So I, I guess I'm getting on my soapbox here um, to release my, I vent my frustration because there's no other time or item to vent that. Um, but somewhere along the line, we've got to think about what the elected members have been elected for, okay, and draw that line in the sand and say, no, the, the, the small stuff, they've been elected to do that. The, the, the staff have their expertise. They've been hired to do that stuff. Okay, so yeah, sure, if we're going to, if we're going to reclaim all the Hokianga Harbour, then I say we should, we should probably consult the locals. But where we put a toilet, where we put a path, all that kind of stuff, is, so quite honestly, that's what we get voted in for. That's what they pay the rates for, for the expertise. So let's draw a line in the sand and cut out with this, with this excessive consultation. Thank you. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Several years ago, I was involved in the um, same problem at Shipwreck Bay. Number you. And the water was coming off the hill onto the beach where the sand was, and it eroded away, just like carcass. 
So what council did was to put a concrete drain in trench. It was a simple thing, costs very few dollars, and the problem was solved. One of the problems we had with the Carcass Street was that drain, uh, river that actually came around there and it eroded its way into land. That river is no longer there. It's gone back to its original form. And it'll be many, many years before it ever comes back, Andy. But I support Dave and the two Daves to spend 150000 on consult would be a joke to those people in Aipara. It's a simple thing to fix. And I, I, my advice to you people who are handling this is to go to Shipwreck Bay and have a look and consult many of ratepayers' money. Thank you, Councillor Rabbit. Does any councillor who hasn't spoken wish to? The Chief Executive would like to make comments. I'm completely sympathetic to uh, the pragmatists in the room who, who uh, because this is one of those one of those sort of engineering clearing things that at least on the surface looks very apparent. We all know what a beach looks like, what a car looks like, and what the tides look like, and we will watch the landforms change over time. So it's overwhelmingly tempting for me too to have a comment about what I reckon would do uh, would fix this thing. So I've got some ideas as well, and I'll bet you they're not the same as some other people in the room, and I'll bet you they're not the same as some people in the community. So I, I think what we would take on board um, whilst we wait in anticipation of what the decision is here is that such a consultant would need to start with the community and that's a dangerous place to hoover up what their suggestions and local knowledge might amount to. But what I'm also aware of is that there are people who, on this planet and in our neighbourhood, who do nothing more than this and train all their lives in hydrology, geography and geology and if that makes people suck their teeth, that maybe it's not as hard as it seems, uh, it is it just, it just is, and I think um, we could we could go ahead and with yet another expedient piece of engineering, because we've done plenty on each of these strategic points of entry to our beaches around the district. We could spend twenty or thirty or forty thousand dollars doing something that we reckon and the local reckons would work, and within two years we could be back at this table thinking we maybe need to get some experts to look at this. So it's a balancing act on risk, really, and it was less than 100000 I wouldn't be here to ask because I have the discretion for unbudgeted funds when it, when it reaches points of this importance. But I just assess that it's going to exceed that. And um, I know Andy and I'll talk later about where this number really should be in a public paper because it doesn't help us go to tender when, uh, when this number's out there as it is at the moment. But it is the top end. And I can't wait to hear what you're going to decide, but I would ask for some elbow space to get this done once and right, um, and not just in a way that is immediately effective, but a way that takes into account what's happening with sea level rise, what's going to happen with those stormwater outflows, what's slightly to happen with sand and even moving on the beach over time, and know that we're not going to be back in this place in a couple of years to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Councillor Foy, as a seconder, I'll give you a moment. Thank you. Um, under A, um, it reads, the current motion reads, the requirement for unplanned operational spend of approximately 150k, and I believe the wording, um, a slight change, one of those words, of up to 150k um, may address the issues of, of my elected colleagues. Also, wanted to I'll just pause there because your own right of reply. So, as the mover of the motion, I'm prepared to entertain amendment to the words up to if there's any matter of concern on my colleagues. Councillor Foy, we will, I will move that we amend the recommendation to include the words up to. Are you happy to second that? Yes, I'll let you continue with your right of reply. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to also speak in support of what our CEO has raised in there. As a result of the investigations, we do need a new stormwater outlet to the coastal run area. We will need to discharge the second regional council. So that will mean that we will need to go into the analysis, the engineering, etc. So um, until we know that, um, we do want a permanent fix, we need to allow for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Foy. So the matter on the item 6.4 has been debated. The recommendation is as per the agenda with the amendment.
amendment from up to at point A. I'm now going to put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against, no. No. Recorded. Thank you. Number five, the conditions are recorded. I'm happy to run it recorded. Have you got that? Thank you. Thank you. That has been passed. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. That one has been a long time coming. Item 6.5, roadside rubbish and recycling. Page 48, item 6.5. I'll move the recommendation for the purposes of the debate. Any other seconder? The author of the report, Mr. Millichamp, is in the room, yes? Yes. Can I open you come up to the podium, please? And the authorizer of the report is Andy Fitch. We'll start with you, Andy. Do you wish to address the report? Through the chair, um, I think the paper is being read. Um, Simon has put together a um, detailed report regarding the ongoing concerns elected members have expressed around roadside rubbish and recycling. Um, but we'll let uh, Simon add any further comments. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, just that it's an information only report. Um, and just as a quick overview, we do have cost effective. Um, solid waste services in the north at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of options sort of outlined in this report and some ballpark figures, just so you have some background and know what we're talking about. Um, would sort of say or emphasise that these are, you know, they are in, on the wish list, but they are nice to have, and I do want to emphasise the service we've got is pretty cost effective. Uh, the other point is that a lot of councils who do have more effective service, uh, more extensive services, like they have council contracted uh, curbside services, etc. Just like to point out that they have similar problems to this about rural collection points, roadside litter, etc. So of these, um, yeah, just just to keep that in mind, I guess, as an introduction. Thank you, Councillor Tiffany. As a second, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, oh, I, I love talking about rubbish <laughs> <laughs> because um, I know that we, we contract out our uh, rubbish and recycling curbside services, um, so it's, it's nothing to do with council, but you know, I would say that 80% of what people touch base with me about is surprisingly, it's always about rubbish. Um, I, I absolutely uh, would love to see some further reports, um, further investigation and analysis come through to us. So I, I, I'm still in support of this recommendation, but I will use this time just to bring up a few things. Um, a monitoring officer is in here, costed it around eighty-two thousand dollars, and I know that you think we're going to pay someone to do something that you know we should. Through education, like people should just be better citizens and not be bloody throwing their rubbish on the side of the road. Um, and you look at that and think eighty-two thousand dollars is the cost of that. But we also know that um, day works costs the council hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to clean it up. So uh, what's the offset or something like that? Can't be seen there because um, the savings we can make on. Um, Chair Edmonds knows that I'm all about signage and how that can, what's the cost of that compared to what you could be saving if it actually stops someone from doing it. Well, now I might be on this luck about getting someone, that person to do it. Um, I also, I also want to see more information about bringing it in house or the next time our contracts come up, how we can have more controls in place. Um, through the CE office, I requested some information I've brought up in the past about the inconsistencies with our curbside um, collections and the communication from that. Um, Kaikou here currently only has five customers who use curbside recycling, but we know that's because the communication around that has been quite poor, but it is getting fixed, but we don't actually have control over that. Also, there are things that we can do. Um, on our website itself, but actually it says to people, oh, if you live rurally, go drop your rubbish off at, a, at the collection point. But 
but we don't actually tell them we need to change that to say on the day or the night before because we're actually not sending the message as a council on our website that from what I read on it, well, I can take it any day and just leave it there. It's not actually telling me that I should not be doing that. And we know that that's one of our big councilmen call out with that too. So that was a nice jump. That was a rubbish audible of using this time, actually, <laughs> just a jump in this. So, but I, I do speak in support of getting more of the coming Thank you, Councillor. Do you like to comment on any of these points? I mean, you can comment on a whole range of things. I don't want to take up too much time. In defence of the waste companies in Kaikoui, they issued free recycling bins when they started the service to every household in the district, and nobody took up and paid for the service. And so, absolutely admitted their communication is not flash, but it's improving. But they have that offer has been made. Um, collection points every, through the last bylaw, there's now signs that the, well, there have been for years at the collection points to say when rubbish. Um, should be deposited there. Uh, overall, on that, the education part, I think most people in the district know it's not right to throw your rubbish out the window. They know it's, they see a sign, they know when the collection point is. Unfortunately, it's that underlying thing of not so much they don't care, other people do it, therefore my little bag won't make any difference. So, yeah. Sorry, it's a quick comment. Keep trying to keep it short. Right, Thank you. Um, so, our, um, we don't contract out our um, rubbish and recycling collection. What's that called? It's um, the um, waste companies do that as a service. We have no control over it. Um, and I just want to remind us all that the waste minimisation plan um, says that Council will meet with um, groups, a bit, you know, to check how we're going. And I guess this report is a way of, you know, checking in with how we're going and what we're doing. But it did, um, and Sea Change have um, raised this with us, Jane Banfield, for example, in the last couple of years, that we're not going out to them and going, how are we going? What do you want to see um, happening? So um, I guess I need. I need some clarity on whether that is um, is it Eco Solutions' job, your job, or do you want help from elected members to do that? Because we have done, you know, we've had casual meetings with um, Sea Change, for example. But do we need to have a public meeting where we can go, hey, what's everyone think about waste minimisation? Here's what you can do as a um, householder, um, and here's what council is looking to do in the future. What else do you think we should do? Uh, I respond now. Um, yes, so through the, the sea change thing, Jane Banfield um, has organised a couple of meetings over the years to discuss waste issues, and I have turned up as has um, Eco Solutions to talk about that. There wasn't a large turnout at the last meeting, which is possibly why she hasn't organised another one. I'm more than happy to attend um, meetings, with, and I would hope that the community board can attend those. Um, and then I can refer them on to Eco Solutions for further, you know, practical help if you like. Whereas I can talk the theory. More than happy to do that because the more people who are aware of waste, one of the problems is people just don't think about it. They just want to drop their bag and go. So the more people talk about it, the better. More than happy to t attend those meetings if community boards mm -hmm. uh, request I attend, etc. Okay, can I get some support um, operationally if I go ahead and organise it myself because I'm, you know remunerated to, to do stuff like that and um, I don't think it should be put on the community members to, to do it when they've got other things happening in their lives. Yes. Yeah, I'm probably not the person to say who and, and where the best way of uh, offering that support, but I'm sure if it's recorded, we'll, uh, you know, support somebody yeah. will be with its community support. Or, cool. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. yeah. Sweetheart. Thank you. I've got a lot of hands went up there, so you've got to go on the order I got you. Councillor Research. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have some questions. I support this. I'm happy with it because we need more information back, particularly about what is the ongoing risk and cost. I know you've got levies going up to $60 from 10 That's a six-fold increase in a relatively short time. <laughs> I, I didn't quite understand the figures. $10 for 5,500 tonnes is 55000 but 60 times 5,500 tonnes is more than what's appearing there in the day. So there's probably a reason for that. So I'm not too worried.
worried about that, but I'm really interested in, in the further study and therefore um, the re, you know, potential returns of making it with increasing the recycling and thus the tonnage to waste because of the extra cost associated with that. But I do you support the further, you know, the, the recommendation to um, get, investigate this whole area. Um, yes, so when it comes to the income from the levy, um, sorry, the, the income that the government receives from the levy, that has not only increased up to $60, they've also expanded the amount of sites that that applies to, clean fill sites, a whole range of different sites, rather than just the municipal landfills that applies to at the moment. When it comes to the money we get back from that return, we get a lot more back than we contribute, largely because all that money goes into the pot. And when I say all that money, the money from the far north is not just the rubbish that the far north and uh, the district council handles, it's all the curbside stuff, the industrial, uh, industrial stuff. That goes into a, a joint, uh, sorry, a nationwide pool, and then, then that gets distributed back to us based on cap, uh, on. Uh, numbers, population number. So we contribute relatively little, but we get a big chunk back. How much exactly we're going to get back won't be determined until the Waste Minimisation Act is reviewed mid next year, and that's when they decide how much of a cut we get. The indications are it will certainly increase substantially, but how, how much we don't know at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor um, so I heard some questions not only about, um, on page 53 it includes some examples of three different councils and I wasn't sure if any of these examples had in-house contracts or if they were all so actually run by the council or if they were contracted out to, to different companies or and if these examples had a landfill within their district or if the landfill was um, a certain distance away. Am I able to answer those questions answered? Yeah. So the, um, the rates that were listed there for the services, yes, they are contract services. Uh, they are council contracted services. That's how much the council is paying to the contractor to deliver the service. The point I probably want to make there is, you know, relatively speaking, what a cheap deal we're getting at around $60 a crate per year. Kaipara District Council are also going to tender, much as sort of most the officers discussed at this time. Um, they're looking at $130 per household for effectively the sort of curbside recycling service we have, crates um, and uh, curbside collection in the main urban centres and rural collection points in you know in the more rural areas. So yes, they are the price, they are contracted services, and that's what the council is paying the contractor to deliver them. So regarding the, sorry, the landfills in the area, from those, uh, some of those uh, services did include waste disposal costs. Overall, the, I mean, yeah, transporting waste out of the district does add cost to it, but overall, the waste disposal part of the of a curbside service is relatively low. So for a three dollar bag, I, from memory, it's maybe. 80 cents, 70 cents is the actual disposal charges, even in an area like the far north where we have to transport it away. The, the main cost is the running around collecting the things and all the customer liaison and all that kind of carry on. Thank you, Councillor Foy. Just to be mindful of your time. Thank you. Um, I wanted to highlight how um, those crates aren't very practical. Um, you have to put a bag of rubbish on top of them or to stop all the or the plastic recycling blown away. There is no option in Taku for a bag to put your recycling in that you can't get that any longer. Um, and that, uh, that's frustrating and also leads to people just not using it as an option. Um, so the options you've got here are for wheelie bins, which are much more practical to be user-friendly and allow for large options for more recycling. Um, so I wanted to highlight that to the elected members about practicality and if people use it or not, and accessibility, and, um, and bringing those recycling bags back in. <laughs> it's an easy solution, and I think the Eastern Ward, if I am correct, still has. You still have bags that you can have for recycling in the Eastern Ward, but not in Tattoo for some reason. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, a couple of technical points uh, and then uh, a further point. So, 
I'm aware that we, um, I would prefer that this recommendation or this resolution allowed for a big picture strategic approach. I'm aware that we've got a few uh, things going on at the moment as it addresses with the, the bylaw coming up for review, but also from an, a Northland wide regional approach. Uh, so my preference would be, I'm concerned that A is limiting in the scope of the piece of work. Uh, I note that it doesn't include uh, or pinpoint recycling options, for example, and waste minimisation. So it's only for litter control, solid waste monitoring, and curbside collections. While that might only be a technicality, we have been seeing resolutions come back to council for review because they have been too specific or not specific enough. So I would appreciate some commentary on the impact of perhaps considering an amendment to those words to ensure that we're including waste minimisation, monitoring and management. The second technicality point that I had was um, around option B. We have a ginormous agenda sitting here in front of us and we can all agree that there are some reports that could have perhaps gone to committee instead. So I would like some commentary as to whether or not council is the right place to receive that report or whether it would be more sufficient to go to the infrastructure committee, for example. Uh, the, the final point that I wanted to make was to pick up on what Councillor Tepanir has already raised. We were fortunate enough to attend the Young Elected Member Hui recently, and Dr Ashley Bloomfield spoke to us as our guest speaker at dinner. One of the points that he has raised that has really stuck with me was when he was asked what New Zealand's strategy of response to COVID-19 was, his response was communication. And when I reflect on our drought response, our strategy to that was communication. So really just highlighting the importance of considering the role of communication and the way we minimise, monitor and manage our solid waste and ensure that that is captured in any reports that are done. So, Madam Chair, I would like some commentary on my technical points, if possible. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Before you answer that, there's another chance to the Section 17A review. So all of those matters that you have raised will be captured in the 17A review. And you'll recall at the start of today's meeting, I did raise the matter that a number of these reports would be better placed to be dealt with that committee. And I did encourage the committee chairs to consider whether any of these matters should go to their committee. Uh, in my closing for this particular matter, I was going to suggest that you liaise with Councillor Stratford, who has a passionate interest in this space and is Chair of Strategy and Environment, uh, Environment and Regulatory, I beg your pardon. Uh, to advance this conversation because this is not a shop, this is a council meeting. So I'm now going to answer Councillor Smith's questions. Um, probably the only comment I've got to add uh, to that is also to point out that solid waste, unlike other um, areas in council, we are legally required to have a solid waste minimise and minimisation and management plan, which is periodically reviewed, which is the probably the time as, as as well as the Section 17 review, that's the sort of time and review place to review the overall uh, solid waste issues. And this report was more as a interim uh, response to various side questions that had been raised at various council meetings I'd attended. Thank you, Mr. Lovechap. Councillor Thank you. Um, yeah, can I just say how much time I gave you a bit of time a week or so ago, or last week or something? just to talk through some issues and that I think we're resolved and I appreciate it this time. Um, it's, perhaps what doesn't come through here as much maybe as it could is that it's a very dy dynamic space at the moment. Solid waste management, recycling. In a sense, that's a good thing because we've had a Waste Minimisation Act for over a decade. My good friend Dandor got over the line to his credit and it hasn't been utilised well at all for that at any time. It is starting to kick in now with the product stewardship which are the longer term solutions, among others. Um, so it's a good thing, but it's also made it incredibly difficult to plan. The fact that China's basically closed the door to no longer wants to be the world's dumping ground for plastic, which is understandable, but it forces us to find other solutions. Um, I think it is a difficult time, but I do look forward to that review process, actually, because I do think we've been a little bit, be a bit creative with some different overall models of how we address waste and litter and everything else across the district. And that'll be, I think, a useful bit of work. I do reflect on a number of other, I'm sorry, more course comments and others about the importance of communication and education. That's, all, that's been true forever and continues to be, just to try and get those messages out there that waste doesn't magically float away and disappear into the ether, that it has to be managed and try and get cooperation on that. 
The only other thing I'd say to voice my frustration about this, um, the reality that community groups are now, it's much more difficult for volunteers to get out and do this work, and that's something kind of imposed on us, that responsibility around what I think increasingly are excessive health and safety um, regulations, and I think that's something in a bigger picture we should be pushing back against. I think sensible grown-up people can do these tasks where excessive risk, but as I say, that's a, that's a bigger picture. So, um, yeah, as I say, I look forward to this overall review and quite happy to support the, the main thrust of the recommendation. Before I pass over to our councillor. Yeah, just uh, wanted to go uh, support what my colleagues have said because I've virtually answered all my questions, but one observation. Um, is that NZTA seems to be picking up the rubbish off the state highways currently. We don't appear to be doing that, but it was volunteers that were doing this, uh, no pretending was said, uh, or it was schools supervised, which we do not get anymore because of health and safety. So it is something that perhaps we need to be considering and perhaps support uh, for that overzealous uh, health and safety regulatory situation. That kills off a lot of the volunteer stuff. Before I hand it back to Mopo, is there any closing comments? I'd just like to capture there's clearly passion in this room. There's clearly elected members would like to have uh, the opportunity to inform what the Section 17A review is. <coughs> I would like to strongly encourage that this matter be taken to the regulatory environment committee. Uh, for a conversation before we commission any work, before we write that report, and that we liaise regularly through Council of Stratford through the development of the report to ensure that all elected members use the caption. And I'll pass it now to Mr. Tiffania. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, very much, I've actually very, very much enjoyed listening to the Kōrero and all the time for the two. Um, further reports and continuing this conversation. Thank you. So I will now put the recommendation item 6.5. All those in favour say aye. 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 Aye.
then how well we are, we might do one or two more before we wait for lunch, but it depends on how well we are. Yes, and I can come up to the podium. The next item on the agenda is item point six, integrated transport strategy. I am going to move the recommendation and report and include in the the Council of Four Years will share that with a potential amendment. Can I have a second of that? Thank you, Council of Stratford. Mr. Finch, as the also office for more authorised official report, I'm in your hands. Through the chair, thank you. Thank you very much for um, allowing us to talk to um, this report, which is a combination of a, a process that we believe has been thorough and um, has been very You don't need to give that endorsement. Um, we would strongly recommend that you do because it strengthens our case to NZTA for um, the roading program. Um, what I would actually say before Keith, um, Keith comments further is we'll be aware that we have submitted currently to NZTA's Transport Investment Online System, the full roading program that came out of the workshops and stakeholder meetings. Um, the clear signals that we are getting from NZTA is that will be moderated down and will be moderated down significantly because of funding pressures nationally around arising from COVID-19 and um, reduction in um, travel movement across the country. So although what we are proposing at this time is uh, our recommendation is clearly unlikely to be fully funded by NZTA. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just for a next amendment, I also need to comment that the, um, the spreadsheets and the agenda are not readable, but they should not be a surprise to you. These are the ones that we workshop. They are in the elected members' lounge. But if you wish, there is an A3 copy behind you on the table over here. My only concern was that this is a public agenda and I would anticipate that they would be visible to the public. I did ask the question and I understand that they are visible on the website uh, because you can blow them up. So uh, apologies that the version that you received, if you received a printed copy of the agenda, uh, was not legible. Mr. Kidd. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, really, in, su in support of this uh, uh, recommendation, I'd just like to reiterate the executive summary we've got for the and to state that I, I see this as, a, as an offer, opportunity that's been offered to us by NZTA to help us promote our programme within the regional land transport programme. It's my attempt to pursue one of the earlier mandates in 2018, several in relation to the transport strategy. And this is part of, of seeking and prioritising capital works to receive NZTA subsidy. So um, there's no guarantee that um, having this programme is this case endorsed and signed off by the NZTA uh, will guarantee us funding, but it will put us in much greater stead uh, in comparison with uh, or against our neighbouring district councils in the RLT. So it will, it will uh, significantly increase our chances uh, and effectively promote the list of programmes we've got from unprioritised, unapproved into uh, approved lists. So we're, we're on a par with a significant number of projects that the DC, for instance, have already got approved. Um, so the, the ITP itself hasn't, or the ITS and the ITP hasn't changed since you were introduced to it in the uh, 
recent uh, long-term plan workshops, particularly the one on the 4th of August. So the, but the problem we've got is that the, that was a workshop session and it wasn't formally minted uh, to a satisfactory level for NZTA to be able to put a tick in the box when they were wanting to sign off the programme business case. So I see this as a, as a relative formality and as I've said in the text uh, there, there, there is nothing to stop uh, further changes uh, in the content of the ITS and the ITP following the long-term plan public consultation if changes are deemed necessary. So this is endorsement prior to adoption, if you like. So it was always our plan to, uh, to seek adoption of the strategy following the long-term plan consultation, but that puts the time scales a little bit out of whack with the uh, RLTP process. So uh, we were very, uh, we were reassured by NZTA uh, the offer really that how about if you give us the, endor the endorsement, council endorsement, we'll we will then be able to sign off the program business case and get things moving a bit quicker. So. No, I would just like to suggest that if we could, Council yes, please endorse this uh, transport strategy and, and its program business case, uh, it would, it would uh, put us in very good stead. Now, the printed programs that are available, um, please bear in mind that they are they're interim. We've got Huge uh, iterations of the programme. So we've already had councils um, approval to submit the the full programme into the into TA finance system. So as Andy says, we've done we've done round one. We'll be moving into round two shortly. So that will give us an opportunity to uh, make further refinements to the programme. Uh, and uh, that is happening as we speak, with, with the NTA doing good work for us in that area. That will also give us an opportunity to pick up on um, issues that I understand were raised regarding um, non-visibility of, of capital works items in some of those lists. Uh, so I would like to reassure the elected members that the, that the lists uh, in, in the printouts that we've got uh, at the moment, I believe they adequately capture all the projects that have been uh, raised to date. But that does, as I say, the lists are being refined. We've got two further stages, so there is no reason why other other projects um, can be brought forward or identified and put on the lists for consideration for inclusion in the uh, RLTP. As a seconder of the motion, Councillor Stratford. Thank you. Um, so, on reading this report, I was like, oh my gosh. Um, I do recall um, us um, saying that we wanted to do some widespread engagement on the integrated transport strategy, um, and we we haven't haven't been able to do that, but I do understand um, the sense of urgency. And when I went right through, not this version of the report, the um, strategy, I went back to the, the document that we were emailed, or it's in the LTP lounge, um, and yeah, just re-familiarise myself with why we did this and the purpose of it. And I commend Councillor Foy for um, moving at the last LTP deliberations to have this integrated transport strategy and the work that staff have done, especially you, Keith, in getting this to fruition. And I, the strategy is trying to address the need to provide a better, safer transport system, address our affordability issues and the seasonal surges and resilience issues that we have, and through um, the, there were two workshops that um, the, the stakeholders that we had um, identified through previous council's stakeholder workshop. So we did that with SLT, determined who the stakeholders would be on big issues. And that probably um, does need to be readdressed 
outside of the transport strategy, um, the stakeholder engagement list that we, we use under this new council. But that aside, I talked to my people that um, got to engage in that space, in those workshops, and they, um, they do feel that the issues that they've raised have been, um, are being addressed because a lot of what they want to see are already in the LTP or they're in um, the Regional Land Transport Plan. And that's, that's what the strategy talks to um, in the, what's the word? The multi-criteria analysis for the organisation <laughs> is using, um, it prioritises the projects that are already in those plans, already have a business case, um, like the integrated cycle um, plan, cycling plan, the um, township plans, um, so I, I feel really comfortable because those those particular things have had community engagement. The LTP has had community engagement. This strategy is in just is just encompassing all of those. Um, so I, I support endorsing it, and um, I also note that um, it says in the strategy that further project business cases. Um, Sorry, the, it's been designed so that further project business, business cases or projects can be um, added in later stages of the implementation plan. Yes, I, lo I loved your report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Councillor Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you uh, to Councillor Stratford for that report. I think it's great. And as one who supported it, in the last long term plan initiative, I, I you know, can't but support it to, to, be, to be fair. Um, and, and I agree with um, Councillor Strack that she summed up very well some of the, some of the comments that I was going to make, which I won't go into. There, there's no such thing as probably an ideal report, and everybody could look at it and say, hey, this is missing, or this app should be looked at this way, and I'd be saying the same as well. Uh, and as an example, they're minor things. For example, our bridges, which are ageing, should we be pushing that forward and so on? But I see the, the room to do all of that. And the key thing that we need to get that strategy in place, refine it. Um, and then as we work through some of the local communities as well, we can then bring out and highlight what's included in that strategy for them. So I'm, I'm supporting it. I think it's a great start. And, um, and yet but there is improvement, but in particular it'd be important to support it is what you raised already key when it goes to the national land transport uh, into the national land transport plan to actually have that endorsement and also show that we're doing our work. Um, it, it's crucial for our funding and, and to improve And given the closure, given the closures we see on State Highway One, I know these are our roads, but uh, it just shows you how important resilience is, and the Southway 10 is not covering the issues as um, I heard yesterday in the community board that the shuttle is just uh, the shuttle is really very struggling to cope with the extra demand on our roads as a result of that closure. So, that's the need for resilience and a strategy. Thank you, Councillor Vucic. I have not seen any hands go up. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge the points that you raised at the beginning of the debate around the legibility of the report. Uh, as a digital agenda reader, I can confirm that I can't read it on screen either when I Zoom. So I just wanted to request that at some point in the very near future, this strategy may be uploaded as a separate document to our website to ensure that it is publicly available, uh, as opposed to being inside an agenda because it does uh, reduce the clarity. Uh, the, the question that I had, Keith, was actually just around the regional land transport plan process, and um, there's a really good timeline outlined in here. My question is, what are the governance touch points in that timeline between August 2021, uh, between now and August 2021, outside of our long-term plan? Are there any reporting points back to the infrastructure committee, for example, as part of that process with the NZTA? Um, good question. Well, obviously, this, as I say, this is an endorsement that you're providing here. I'm sure that the regional land transport plan will require uh, some form of feedback from, from us regarding the, 
long-term plan consultation and the support from the communities, the, the, the final indication of support from the, uh, from the communities. Mr. Fletcher, to, to, to the chair, thank you for the question. Really good point, and it was something that was discussed at the Regional Land Transport Committee yesterday, um, and a, an issue that we raised around the, um, the parallel processes of developing the Regional Land Transport Programme and the long-term plan in regard of the regional <coughs> program. And um, we had an initial indication yesterday from the Regional Land Transport Committee that they would be seeking to do a regional consultation on the regional planning yeah. program around March, which um, does obviously cause us to next around the timing around our consultation around the LTP, which um, has overlaps, particularly around, just around the roading program. Um, in terms of uh, reporting back to committee, then ideally, <coughs> Love to, um, and I think if there is an opportunity to get this, to get um, updates as we go forward to um, either the infrastructure committee or for council, we would take that opportunity. But we are to some extent um, hostage to fortune around the timing of us having to go out with the long term plan um, and the timing of when the national government releases information. Um, if it's at all possible, we will do so. Um, that is the, the um, undertaking I'm happy to provide. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Perhaps uh, it would be appropriate to just note that uh, that conversation could continue between the Chair of Infrastructure and our General Manager of Infrastructure, just to look at what those reporting uh, opportunities might be, especially in terms of the involvement of the consultation and our engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and signed to have this on the agenda uh, today, and we've been working towards this for a while. I have to say that um, for the projects that are in there, I was disappointed that there were no workshops in Kota. I've already raised this, and um, that's, that resulted in um, a lack of engagement with people in Kaku who to drive as well. Um, and I think it would help to have a workshop with the Tehu Community Board with the Transport Planner about the projects. Um, we have the Community Board Chair here as well that um, may want to speak about the projects which haven't been included um, in this transport strategy, which have been uploaded in digital spatially represented plans to the LTP lounge for elected uh, members to see. It won't be a surprise. Um, as well, so Monganui to Paipenua Island cycle trail was a um, shovel ready application. There's already plans done for that, um, and it was successful with some of the money, but not all the money to action the, um, the cycle trail shared path, um, shared path. I don't see that as a project of the list. Um, there is the Pukanui walkway, um, which part of it has been included in the long-term plan and the reserves, but part of it is within the state highway and local roads. Um, there's the plan for that in the LTP lounge as well. And um, there's four um, routes, which would be Ahipada to Kaitaia, which is the most popular feedback that we see at the members about a request from the public um, to access along the um, Te Araroa Wuki Trail. Um, we saw on our, bus tra on our bus trip the walkers trying to walk along, unfortunately, the most dangerous link of road in the finals currently, with extremely high death rates. Um, the next link would be Ahipa, uh, to, uh, sorry, Pai Pai to Awanui, and Awanui to Waipakakodi, which follows the current um, walking uh, and cycling route along the beach. So there's no formed track along the beach, it's just the original road, <laughs> the sand. Um, and so with with those, I have requested in the long-term plan for them to be separate um, line items. We have had those costed and um, would like to see those being represented as separate line items. And I can read the email that, has, that I asked about this question. And it says that the footpaths manager, Sandy Morris, 
um, we'll be looking at criteria evaluation and prioritisation using the ex existing matrix, but a council mandated variation would be needed to promote these uh, projects as separate line items in the program. And currently they do not have a separate line item and as uh, Councillor Stratford has highlighted, unless they're a separate line item and have a business case and get designed, it's unlikely they will come to fruition ever. Would like all of our hard work from our community board to be recognised and for to for Tehu to have some cycle trail, which they currently have zero. Um, and um, I don't know if Member um, Adele Gardner would like to speak as well about this item. Um, I will now ask Mr. Kim to finish your questions, please. Yes. Um, we'll go on to those projects that you. Uh, mentioned there. I'm quite confident that they are in the current program, so please uh, have a look at them. <coughs> Happy to talk through them if you want to. To satisfy you both that, that they're in the program, but I, I can't assure you that they are certain that they are in as separate line items for the, for the, from the feedback we've already got. From us regarding that, so you're suggesting that you, you've got low confidence that if if they're not a separate line item, they'll get no there. Well, I'd like to reassure you that if they are if they are valid projects, uh, uh, sufficient criteria boxes, they will they will escalate to the, up into the higher priorities and rankings, and and become worthy projects. So we've got that process to go through. And the whole point of the many lists that we've got in there is to, is to make sure that they go through a fair and equitable um, criteria evaluation, multi-criteria analysis to make sure that they are the right ones. So, so can I ask the Chief Executive at this point that is it possible for you to arrange for the three community boards, not just to Haku, the three community boards, to be able to have a session on the integrated transport strategy so they can understand how it works and where your projects achieve. Yes. And you have said to us today, Mr. Kemp, that this there will be further opportunities for us to moderate the spreadsheets. So I'm going to suggest to the committee that we allow that first process to happen with the community boards prior to any final or further council conversations around the spreadsheets per se. Does timeline, I just asked the staff for timeline products because I thought your request was to, to inform them because, because it's such an advanced draft with so much elected member input so far, whether it's now a matter of making sure they're fully familiar with what's planned or whether we're actually seeking to advise. And governance comfort, Mr. Mr. Kent has just explained that he is confident that all of those projects are in there. The community boards need that visibility and level of comfort, which clearly they currently don't have. None of this forestalls the recommendation going forward today. Thanks, that's what's up to. Okay. So if there's um, a, a matter, no, thank you, Councillor, for you've had your five minutes. Um, Gardner, thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll yeah. um, thank you, Keith, for a good report. Thank you. And, and I was one of the ones that was invited to the session, the one that attend. Um, and I did see a list of people from the Tahuku Ward that were invited, but obviously didn't come. Because I guess the distance and time factor of driving to and from and allowing for the meeting, etc. Um, and, and I would really like to invite you to attend the meeting meetings or whoever is going to present it on the strategy so that we have an input as well. Thanks on behalf of the Thank you. Thank you. We have assurance from the Chief Executive that will happen. So 
Are there any further questions from anyone who hasn't hit the floor? If not, I will come back to Councillor Stratford and try to reply. Thank you. Um, I just want to, um, and like, it's not just about this document. I think um, all elected members, including councillors, need to understand how they can get their projects into the integrated transport strategy or, or plan. And it's not just through this document, it's through the LTP process, it's through the regional land transport process, it's through having some understanding around the government policy statement as well. And so I think a, um, a, a greater workshop or making sure that they all um, tap into the Waka Kotahi site as well, because they provide free workshops online as well. Um, yeah, I, I think it, that's really key. And um, there was something else I was going to say about bridges in response to Councillor Vucic. Oh, that's right. We, we finished one bridge. Hooray. Otawa Bridge is completed. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's still some work to do on the road, but um, they're getting there. Thank you. Councillor Stratford, um, just before I put the motion, we had a regional land transport committee meeting yesterday and we had a workshop following the meeting. As part of the meeting yesterday, the meeting schedule was set for the next year. As Mr Finch has articulated, there is going to be the Regional Land Transport Committee on tour, uh, and, but we are responsible for Northland, so we will be hosting meetings um, in March all over Northland, and these are public sessions. So the documentation will be released prior to those sessions, and these will be called Have Your Say Days, and we will ask our lovely ladies from Democracy Services to make sure that they're highlighted in the formal meeting calendar so that you can share these uh, with your networks. Uh, and, and I strongly encourage everyone to take the opportunity to read those plans and to come along to the open day and have your say to the entire committee, of which Justin Blakely is now on. So it's wonderful to have another representative um, north of the border. That's his name, isn't it? The chair is here this morning. Yeah, Blakely. And the chair is Rick. Okay, so I have had my little five cents worth. I've now um, put the motion on page 56. All those in favour say aye. Those against, no, carry. Thank you very much. I'm going to go for one more before I let you off for lunch. Thank you very much, Mr. Kent. Adoption of the annual report. And before I talk the recommendation on page 6.7, we have an amendment. And the award of the day goes to Councillor Stratford, who I'm quietly confident is the only elected member. Uh, that's read every single word of that document and put, picked up an error. And I apologise if someone else read every single word of that document because I can hand on my heart tell you that I did not and I did not pick up on the error. So, Janice, would you like to comment, please? Um, yes, yeah, thank you, Councillor Stratford. Um, um, Councillor Stratford pointed out to us yesterday on page 53 under the file of um, holding these key initiatives. The words used under initiative seven actually relate to the industrial uh, park and not to us awards. Um, so we need to replace those words. So the contribution to strategic objectives, um, can you go down one? That's it. Um, you'll see it, it refers to the uh, Russell Wall being utilised as a dairy farm, so that is clearly an error. Um, it's more than a grammatical change, so we do need you to pass a resolution for me to put the correct words in. So I will move that amendment. Do you have that available to share on the screen, please? Can I have a seconder? Yep. <clears throat> and before I open up the floor, thank you to Councillor McClendon, who queried up on the independent report. You now have a copy of that. Everyone has one on the table. Excuse me. Okay, so it's now open to the floor. Any elected members? Any 
be questions on the end of the board. Councillor Tiffany. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this uh, earlier iteration of this came through half, um, and I just wanted to thank staff um, on acting on my lovely councillor teacher, Tiffany, table was sent through. Um, that would, I think this is going to be a bit of a tradition during my um, term on this council. There are, it's looking really good in that space. There are a few grammatical errors that I'll be prepared to buy a table to start on. Um, but otherwise, it's already come through me. No doubt, I've uh, they let me contributed to the way that they can contribute. Thank you, Councillor. Any other elected member wish to comment? Yeah, so um, the annual report is one of the second most important documents we as governance will gloss our eyes over. Um, but I think, um, you know, it's, it, it's also something that our residents and ratepayers sometimes read. I, I read them in the past before becoming an elected member. Um, because it, it tells us whether we've achieved all our items in the LTP and it um, reports on our performance against our measures. And um, what I did find in this report, and everybody knows, is that there were some slip, slipping due to our twin crises, the COVID and drought. Um, but that's that's fair enough, and it's it's in there, clear as day. But I... I do want to um, put on my Three Waters portfolio hat and just remind us that the drinking water, it's three years in a row that we have dissatisfaction and it relates to not just um, resilience around water but the taste and smell. And um, I think my hair is, is on our radar. We, we are doing some work around that in improving the Paihe supply. But it um, reminded me this morning when I filled up my glass. Um, and also um, in 3.1, reliable wastewater infrastructure. You know, there are some, this um, an abatement and an infringement. Um, and you know, my goal is for zero of those. So we, we've got to move, move on our improvements. Um, and then the other item, just in, on page 161, and I don't know if that's of the agenda or the, oh yeah, it's in that separate report. Anybody else can find it faster. There's, um, you know, those pictures where it says um, towns and, the picture of towns and villages across the district, one of those little um, icons. Um, I think the wording is meant to be diverse. And then in the um, table dispersed, of... Dispersed, page 161. Yes, something else, Dispersed. Right? Dispersed, is dispersed, it meant to be? Dispersed towns? Yeah, should it be dispersed or dispersed or diverse? And then in the table of uh, what the abbreviations are, um, it, um, NZTA is abbreviated as, um, you know, New Zealand Transport Association, but it's also known as Waka Kotahi, so can we update it to have Waka Kotahi in there, because that's its um, mostly referred to name now. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll send it to you. Thank you. That'd be great. Thank you. Just briefly, while we're showing off our little knowledge of the document, <laughs> page nine, we are told the council ended a strong cash position of $10.3 million due to prudent cash management. So that was a bad idea. We're really in our own strong cash position. I think there's a word in there with perhaps. The statement as it stands is not very complimentary. Uh, page, page, page nine of the report. Probably ended the year. The digital version. Not sure what page it appears on here.
would like to um, impress us all by demonstrating that they've read the document. And we found a typo or a grammatical error. Can you please get that through? Because the recommendation provides that the general manager corporate services can make any minor grammatical amendments. So if there's any other councillor wish to speak to this matter, I'd like to offer the floor to councillor views, such as Chair Park, who may wish to make comments. I just want to thank Councillor Strickland because that went for us because, as you pointed out, and we missed that um, correction there. So, um, thank you. No, I'm, I'm happy with Peter and I'll make comments on the time. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a, a comment. The statement of service provision, uh, which demonstrates how each of the uh, services that we provide deliver the outcomes that we have set. Uh, strategically, just perhaps food for thought in a conversation that I would like to have going forward is that currently we, we only allocate one outcome to each of those services, where if you dive deep enough, you could probably say that we deliver all of the outcomes for all of the services. So just signalling that it's a conversation that I would like to have, whether or not there's opportunity to do that with this LTP, I'm not sure. But otherwise, thank you for the report. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Is there any other councillor who wishes to speak to this motion? No, I'll put it. All in favour say aye. Aye. Okay. No, thank you. I'm now going to call an adjournment for lunch, half an hour. And if you do not wish to hear that gavel banging, please be back here at five past.
to be developing a better working relationship between ourselves and our CCO. While I recognise that they are standalone and we give them a statement of intent and a mandate, I think that I would be quite interested in hearing whether there is opportunity for us to sit down and have a strategic planning day with Far North Holdings and the lead into their statement of intent process to really look at what those opportunities are, what's working, what's not, and how we reflect them. So I just wanted to table that here, again, not related to the report, but grabbing the opportunity. And, and, and I agree with that, and they've expressed that they're happy to do that as well. Uh, given that we're on a public forum, there's no, no issue there. I think um, with complete respect for the deputation this morning, raising some issues around the FNHL. I mean, I've got a 15 page document here, which um, is the other side of the corner, if you like, and to understand the, the opportunities as well as the threats out of our, out of our high performing commercial arm um, is a conversation well worth having with as many people as you want in the room. So, um, Genesis is just going to be the nod. Something's already on the Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other elected member like to make comments? Councillor McCauley. Yeah, um, I, I just wonder, you know, do we recognise that there is actually something wrong with the final holdings that we have to do more checking than what we what has already taken place? We have a statement of intent. Well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Or is it broke?
uh, opportunities that we could have. And there's other uh, examples such as Napia that are providing significant housing options for their district. And we know that's a significant barrier uh, and issue for our district as well. Uh, and uh, Hamilton City Council also um, have achieved strategic purposes to revitalise their houses. So, um, I just want to raise that with my fellow elected members for our workshops and I'll be bringing it up. Thank you, Councillor Point. Does any other elected member wish to speak to the motion, please? And the motion is got the report. I understand that we've wandered a bit here in talking about a workshop with Farm or Coley and the purpose and function. That's not on the table. This is to adopt the annual report. Any other elected member have any comments? If not. Councillor Vestich, you seconded it. Do you wish to have a cry for the slide? Uh, I'm wounded. Uh, again, thank you. And, and they did express a thank to Councillor as well. Maybe I should follow that so they can get it. And there are some excellent initiatives that they'd love to have a workshop on. So. so I'm going, surely going to put the motion, but we did wonder if deviate a bit off topic there, but you have, I have confidence that you've got that in train. And that a workshop will be held at some point in, the, in 2020. Thank you very much. Check the timing. 2021. But also to capture. It will be as soon as we can before the SLI. Thank you. It will be adopted. It will lead into the SLI as opposed to after. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will now put the recommendation item 6.8. All in favour say aye. 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 If you no, no. Thank you. Item 6.9, in noting that Council Research has circulated a revised terms of reference, I am still going to move the recommendation uh, on page 82, uh, noting that the substantive item is the revised terms of reference. So I'll move that. Do I have a second? Thank, Thank you, Council of Research. Council of Research, in your hands as the um, nominated chair of the committee. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. As a chair, I did, um, when the substantive reference draft was sent out, I did the following day revise it. And I apologise for that. I'm not sure if the name was sooner than being in the sheet. Now, just, just so we're clear, because there's been enough, and I have discussed with some community board members uh, who've raised concern for me in terms of the working party and what it actually does. So we're clear. What, what I see the working party doing is looking at an issue that has been raised that the, the community board may have between <coughs> their role and connection with, with um, staff and council. And this committee is, is looking at how you know, what can we learn from these issues that are concerned? So we're going to look at an example. And it's not about a problem. If I, maybe I'll use an example, which is a good way of doing it, and say, if there's a broken footpath and it's causing angst on one of the community board, they come along and say, this is not being fixed. Mr. the working party. Can you kind of get it fixed? That's not the role of the working party. The working party is to look at and say, well, what has actually happened that has caused that? that problem, and it could well be a misunderstanding, it could be something else, uh, um, it could be just simply an honest mistake. So that's what it's about, and as I see, community, the community boards would play a key role currently um, with our communities, and also governance will be, which is a phrase that's being used by LGMT, which I think is a good one, and that, that I expect to continue in the future. So it's, it's really important that we get our community boards working to the max. So, Madam Chair, without going on too more, so that's, in, in terms of reporting, I'm expecting the committee will, will bring, as you see on the second page, of not the list of the membership there, which is really just a committee of the chairs, myself, which John has asked me to chair this committee, one of the councillors, which is Councillor Rachel Smith, because of her special role um, in governance and strategy, but also she's on the um, um, other LGNZ as well. So, Wrong. But as I made a note there, for specific problems that issue that arise, I'm expecting that the appropriate people on that community board, whoever they be, will be part of that. So it's not excluding anybody in that sense. Um, and that could include uh, councillors, but certainly staff 
the key people who have the connection between the staff, it's creating this environment of extracting the maximum information you can from the issue that essentially is creating a learning culture that exists there, which will ultimately result in better overall performance uh, of all included. So that in a nutshell, sorry if I've gone on a bit too long, Madam Chair, but that's what, what Thank you, Councillor Busich. Could you please address the matter of delegation? So this morning, two matters have come up. One is in regard to road naming, the other one, is, one was in relation to halls. By the way, I've got a note here. Could we all speak up, please, for the live stream? Um, so, will you be bringing a recommendation to Council? Yeah, so to answer you, Madam Chair, I will speak up, sorry, to the live streaming guys. So, what I get, just in specific to that question that has been asked, will, will the working party deal with that? What I would plan to do is to go around to the community boards, and I have done this yesterday with the poking up, and said, what are the burning issues that you actually have? We'll get a list out of those, and, and out of that list, uh, we're not going to try and attack them all at once. We'll get a, we'll get a work program which will go forward, and that will then allow to set the times of what we're going to look, what it look like. And to answer the final part um, of your question is, will the recommendations go to the council? Not necessarily. The recommendations will go, as a committee will work, the recommendations that come out of what we learned will be in conjunction with the staff. And then depending on what it is, it could be um, a change in uh, delegations as, as raised, in which case that's likely to go and be discussed at the strategy and policy committee when we start looking at it, um, or somewhere else or in with the council. So I'm not going to specifically say it's going to go all going to council, it could well be dealt with by staff, it could be going to the strategy committee. I hope that answers that question. Well, thank you, Councillor The floor is Councillor Tiffany. Thank you, Madam Chief. Um, I, I just have a, you know, a, a question around the membership on the um, terms of reference here. Do we have to have in, in brackets there that Mayor Carter is an optional member dependent on availability? I um, think it's a given that the Mayor will be dependent on availability, or whether any member would be. Or can it just be a note that it's not actually one of the eight members that the, the mayor will also attend? I just think that the whole point of this is to bring community boards and council better together. And just having that little line there in brackets to me seems that it's not as important. I don't know if that's the connotation I get from it, but you know what I mean. So could we make the mayor um, will be, at, will be in attendance when he can, or is he going to be a full member, or if he is, then take that out. And actually, every single member is it's going to be dependent on their availability if they can make it or not. So, Thank you, Councillor. You also asked uh, or just commenting on the fact whether there should be names there rather than they should be positions. Thank you, Councillor. You said just been responding, responding to that, I'm aware that the Mayor is very busy. And I'm hoping that the other members would treat this committee as being important because it will not, uh, I don't think it will mean that we can't get all the people there. And therefore, saying that the mayor is there is, is confident because of the importance of the, what we're looking at, it's important to be able to have the mayor at that level there or anybody that he would choose to delegate. So maybe it's a bail, um, the potential availability is not the right term. So I agree with you there. Maybe it should be, um, I'm giving him the option to delegate, essentially. Um, and I apologise if it's not clear again. But for the other members, um, obviously, some can't make it. I understand that, and that applies to everybody. Um, but I'm essentially allowing the mayor the option of saying delegation. Councillor, does that satisfy your inquiry? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Councillor Vesic, for putting this together. Um, I do have a couple of items of feedback that I'd like to especially receive uh, from Councillor Vesic and the community board chairs. Uh, considering the item raised earlier today around delegations, and you've identified that that is a problem, I would like to propose that we add a sixth objective in for uh, the working party to consider current community board delegations and recommend any changes to council 
in the absence of any current process to be looking at that. I think that this is the prime opportunity to be doing this, but I think it's really important that we're including it as the, an objective and our terms of reference. So that's my first um, point for uh, feedback when I get to the end. Uh, just in terms of membership, I note that both our CEO and our General Manager of Corporate Services have been added as members from the initial proposed terms of reference. Uh, I would really appreciate some clarification as to what that means, what the impact of that is, uh, whether you, those members become, they obviously become working members of the party, which I think is great because there are uh, issues around how community boards fit with the operational side of this organisation that we need to work on as well. But I would just really appreciate uh, perhaps some feedback from our CEO around that and whether there are any implications to including you as members of the working party. Uh, the, uh, just to get slightly technical, back to the objectives, Objective three, identify barriers to community board enablement. I think that it's really important that we also ensure that we're clarifying how community boards fit within Far North District Council. Again, looking for advice as to whether or not we need to be getting that specific in the terms of reference. Just really don't want to be eliminating us from scope. Just to speak in support of the kaupapa of the working party, I think it's an incredibly important piece of work that we need to be doing, so I commend Councillor Busich for picking this up and running with it. Um, I'm hopeful that we can make this working party as effective as possible in a shorter time frame as possible. I would hate to see any fruition come to this at the end of the triennium, so uh, just wanting to make sure that we are empowered to make change, to make the recommendations that we need to be, and the processes are enabled to do that. Thank you. I will let uh, the Chief Executive answer because you asked him specifically to do so. I think it's Councillor through the Chair. I would read with Councillor Bessich on this. This is intensity about the, you know, in terms of lane keeping, which I love the way we have an open conversation around that between the political and the operational roles in our council. This is intensely about the interface between those two lanes, and so it seems um, even obvious that there should be reps from both sides. So it was just an afterthought, really, to make sure that um, I'm there for the obvious reason that I'm the signatory on the communications protocol, which is also about this, and Will Taylor, because he um, is accountable for democracy services who are up their elbows in this um, issue at, at ongoing. So. Yeah, a no, a no brainer to me too, if, if you're comfortable. Could you comment, please, on Councillor Smith's uh, suggestion that we add a sixth objective? Did you have some particular delegations in mind that couldn't be? Because what I, I must say, my bias is towards what I really like about uh, what the Council's put in here and not with the encouragement is that the um, this working, this expected term, the working party is through the March 21. And so he's signalling to me that this is a. Uh, but a re-engineering on the way we um, run the, the community board interface and how they fit and what their authority is. I love it that that's going you know, to get it done now and then wind the group up with some new rules that everyone will love. I'm just not sure what you've got in mind in terms of delegations. I think that we've heard, heard several times over the term and last term as well that the interpretation from community boards is that the current delegations aren't necessarily working. As a councillor, I don't have full understanding of that, and I would expect that that would be led from a community board level, not from my level. So I think it's really important that we have a specific conversation around delegations, which has been requested for a very long time, around what is working, what isn't working, and how we need to be considering that. I would appreciate seeing it specifically. If we wanted to get really broad, you could interpret that as part of the work stream, but I think that it is a priority, so I would appreciate yep, uh, being able to specify. I now get what you're talking about. So this is down to to, you know, like um, Peter wrote this morning about why, is it, why isn't that sitting within the community board's delegations and, by the way, what else could be, you know, and we're, we're, we're uh, wide open to that. Thank you, Councillor. I can just make sure she's in the light of that. We've got some hands up down here, so I want to go down the end of the table. We're going to start with the evidence because I know he's a passionate, interesting face. Oh, look, I, mean, I, 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 I could talk about delegations all day. Um, You've got five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can talk about delegations for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, yeah, look, I, I have to disagree. I don't, I don't think delegations sit in here. I mean, this is, as, as Sean, I was going to use your words exactly, Sean. This is about the 
case. This is about the relationship that the council has, or the council, Sean, really, and Sean has, and his team have with the community board. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that the community board, and I, I, would, I think it's largely a mix, sorry, mismatched expectations, to be quite honest. Um, and so, and we, there's a lot to be learned there uh, in, in this working party. So I don't think delegations, delegations are a different topic, they're a larger topic. Um, and also they're a separate topic that, is, that can be done in parallel. Um, so as long as we're talking about delegations, um, I, I may mention this morning, which is what you, you brought up, uh, Rachel, about the delegations that we've been asking for for quite some time um, from the committee board. You know, and I just want to make a note, and this will be really the only note that I have to make, is that um, Schedule 7, Clause 32, Subsection 1, um, allows that you may make, if you choose, delegations to the CEO. Okay, but so, um, Subsection 6 um, uses the word must when it refers to community boards. You must consider requests for delegations from community boards, um, and which is which you've not done. So we've had delegations, requests for delegations on the table for more than a year now, and the, the council hasn't um, hasn't discussed or considered those delegations. So I mean, I, I don't call a, a council high performing or progressive um, if they pick and choose between the laws that they adhere to. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's just um, one point. Um, in the original um, that was in the agenda, and now we're looking at the revised one, um, Councillor Ford was in the original, but she doesn't appear to be in the in the working party. Is there, is there a, um... so I can, in my reply, I can mention that as well. Oh, thank you. Does any other need to Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you, just briefly. Just to um, Rachel's suggestion and response. I take your point. It is a big issue and a conversation, but you also make the point that the topic's been sort of floating in limbo for 12 months. Mm. I would have thought this was an opportunity to get it resolved. But, but why not yeah. here? I mean, if not here, then where? Oh, no, I just don't want to be, I don't want to be excused. Oh, that's simply the question I pose. I mean, I think it is an issue, it has been, and we've seen it in large ways and small. And I just wonder, if we don't put it on this working group, then the danger is it floats away again for another 12 months and isn't resolved. So I'd, I'd take the support the idea of adding it to the, um, the TOR. Can I clarify? Thank you. Um, thank you. Councillor Bishop will have wide reply. Councillor Stratford. Mine is around the same point. Um, how do we resolve the issue of community board delegations if it isn't through this um, working group? Um, terms of reference, and there's a um, resolution that from the Kaikwe Hukianga Community Board, um, can, which committee does that sit with? Can it go to their committee? Can we just crack on and resolve that there? <coughs> Sean's nodding. Thank you. Thank you. I was just getting a point of clarification. I was just asking if a formal request had ever been received to consider delegation I understand that it's still a work in progress from the board. From the board, I understand it may have been raised in a member's report, it may have been verbally requested, but I'm still looking for that formal resolution. The, the for board clarity. didn't ask for formal resolution. Yeah, there were three formal resolutions. Thank you. Thank you. So delegations, thank you, Madam Chair, delegations have been raised and we were requested from a very first combined community board workshop to be top of the agenda and we were assured by democracy services or governments that it would be, that didn't happen, and then of course we reached out in COVID. So that's why we're in limbo a year down the track, and I feel um, that we're well on the way to resolving some of these issues. Thank you to Councillor Vesich for picking it up, um, and to the CEO and, and Mike for working together on this, because I really feel that we are starting to get somewhere. And governance or democracy services. Um, thank you for the work you're doing in the action sheets and tracking systems. There is quite a bit being done behind the scenes, which I'd like to acknowledge. Um, but delegations, um, I still have new members on my board asking, what are they? We've got a list of things. What do we do and what are we expected to do with them and how do we do it? And that's all we're really asking for, and it's all part of that 
that will form part of our uh, this document that will be how how this new handover and new council and new elected members and representatives actually are informed as they come on board. And, and we as boards don't feel, even though it's extremely informative from a council perspective, from an elected member, new elected member perspective in particular, um, it's really lacking in a lot of ways. So I think that we've got some of the answers and we just need to work together to keep going down the road to, to sort them out. We've just had some verification that delegations was on the last community board meeting, uh, combined community board meeting, but was bumped, but it is on the next one. So I'm just going to ask Council of Usage at this point if you would like to consider adding delegations before I give you right of a slide. Um, we'd be happy to add consider adding delegations at a fixed objective at this point. I would say <coughs> no. If you look at point three and the reason why, it says to identify barriers to community board enablement. Now, misunderstanding of the delegation, uh, which is one of the issues raised, and well aware of the issues being raised, um, is not changing any delegation or setting any other delegations, but training delegations, and, uh, and that including both staff and community board members. And that's definitely an issue uh, to be recognised. And the other one, though, is inappropriate delegations. And inappropriate delegations means that, yes, you then need to consider a new delegation. And, and I don't believe it's appropriate for this working party to have that right to set delegations, which it probably can't, nor can the I think that has to go to council. So out of here would be a recommendation, should there be inappropriate delegations given to our community board members, um, that's what would go to make we can make the recommendation. So but, so that's why I don't think it's you know, I can, I'm happy to spell it out in here and then my various community board and they including inappropriate communications, something like that. So I don't really think that we can party should be given that mandate. Because there are other better chairs. Point of clarification, Madam Chair, I did say and recommend any changes to council which hasn't been identified in these terms of reference. But I think that it's really important that that is outlined. Yeah, that's definitely, and I'll take that on board. I think we've I think we've gone as far as we can with this right now. I think we have a a working party who has a clear line of accountability back to council and by the chief executive office to uh, enable any changes and delegations that need to come back to full council. And I do believe that full delegations does need to go to the combined community board working parties so they all have eyes on that, not just the three chairs with respect. Yep. So having said that, if there's no further debate, and I recognise that everyone has had the opportunity to speak, with the exception of two members, do you wish to raise anything? Okay. Councillor Vardic? No, so Councillor Bishop, do you wish to have a final reply? Final reply, just, just answering one other question then is uh, why is the membership there? I think it is a community board management uh, role. I didn't want to put community uh, elected councillors on there. It's not to say they won't be involved if we discuss with the delegation where it goes, generally councillors will be involved. Um, and when a particular issue is brought up, I'm aware there are councillors on committees. And I'm expecting that when the particular issue comes up, whatever it be, uh, like Belinda is saying about the, what delegations mean, but I'm expecting those of the members uh, as customers on the, on the community, the board, board community board members, whoever they be, will be actually around the table as well. And that's on a specific issue on a mission basis. So I'm not trying to cut anybody out, but I'm trying to keep a very mean uh, um, committee uh, with that. Thank you, Councillor. The research has been well canvassed. I do appreciate that some people would like the opportunity to speak again. But I would encourage you to sit in the working party. Uh, the, ref, the terms of reference are quite broad. I think they can be anything that you really want them to be the way they can be written. And I would encourage you to use that process and, and get involved in your very good hands with Councillor of Usage at the helm. So, having said that, I will now put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against, no. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a very important discussion. Could I just take a second, Della, that's been passed? Can we just be absolutely clear about what the amendments have been to the approved document? Mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. uh, that point seven and eight under membership have had the names removed, so the positions only. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that there's a rephrasing of what's next to me and John Carter's 
Jane, what was that rephrasing through the council? By invitation? Uh, well, the words yeah. for a delegated person, I thought, yeah. was the intent. Yeah. 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 So I can see this article, and then nothing in addition to, this, to the strike. Thank you very much. for our policy reviews. It's not um, specifically noted here. Um, and I think we will look at it in light of the journey that we're on. And it may well be that in a year's time, we might need to actually review it because it's no longer quite fitting the purpose as we've greened all together and, and learned. And it may well be that we decide after two years that it actually still is fit for purpose and we want to see it um, extend for a little bit longer because we're still again, greening, but it's taking a bit longer. So um, I will always have my eagle eye on whether this policy is still delivering the intent of our sustainable procurement framework. Does any other councillor wish to speak in Councillor Stratford? I think Rachel had a hand. you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just going to get down in the weeds for one one moment. Um, the way that um, tenders are um, assessed, I'm familiar with a number of programs that contractors have to submit their health and safety and environment management plans into. Site-wise, that we apparently use isn't one of those. 
So um, there are other other systems that deal with um, a contractor will have an environment management plan and how it addresses sustainability is is not um, going into site you know site wise don't evaluate that. So I'm just wondering if we are evaluating their environmental management environmental management system separate from the site wise grading. Through the chair, um, site-wise is a purely health and safety yes. um, mechanism for ensuring that any supplier we engage have appropriate health and safety um, controls and um, systems. Uh, the, this policy is looking at expanding that evaluation to um, include uh, a number of criteria and there's a, a raft of, um, a raft of sustainable um, procurement that doesn't only just come up down to localism, but also the environment, yeah. employment opportunities, and also <coughs> do need to just bear in mind that sustainable procurement um, does give us the opportunity to press a number of levers um, to get the outcomes that you as a member may wish. Awesome, cool. I look forward to those improvements. There's just um, also page 89, it says you're a manger, a manager. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had Chris Martin, right? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Carolyn, for this report. It's incredibly exciting and it's a fantastic policy. I had three points that I just wanted to give feedback on. The first one being around uh, Councillor Clendon's points to the review process. So my question was going to be what the reporting looks like alongside this, whether there would be any outcome reporting to audit risk and finance and what that frequency would be like, uh, would look like. My second uh, point was around the resourcing of the policy. So it talks a lot about the importance of a proactive approach to ensure that it is geared for success. So my question is, are we resourced to have that proactive approach? If not, do we need to be having that conversation? And does that re require a further report back to council to look at what opportunities are there? And then <clears throat> my third point was around uh, Councillor Tipanier and I uh, hold the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs portfolio. Obviously, this uh, with that portfolio could create a lot of fantastic outcomes. So I think it's really important that we take this on board. I did note that um, there is an indication that suppliers will be provided with a sustainable outcomes framework suppliers guide. I just really like to highlight how important it is that these resources are also provided to our education to employment providers, such as the ones that we heard from this morning, the Solomon Group. Uh, We've got a number within our community. So working with them as well, Councillor Tipanea and I have earlier met with Solomon Group and they have a huge appetite to be working uh, in a better partnership space than they already are. So really just wanted to raise that and look at how we can use this policy as a tool to build those relationships to achieve the outcomes with resource sitting alongside that. Thank you. So I'm hard of mind. Would you mind taking me back to point one that you would like to have? Uh, it was just around the reporting. Yes, uh, the reporting. Thank you. Um, you can never give me three points. In sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. A little bit older. Um, so in terms of reporting, yes, we will be reporting back through the Audit Finance and Risk, Assurance Finance and Risk Committee. Uh, the frequency at this point is quarterly. Um, and that obviously depends on us commencing using the framework and engaging with our supply market and engaging with our key stakeholders as to when that first report will come up next year. Um, but as it is intended to be specifically reported on, sustainable outcomes achieved as a result of our procurement at every um, quarterly hour committee. The second point on to resourcing, yes, we are currently looking at that. We do recognise that there is some embedding time associated with making this part of our DNA and part of the way that we do things here, and that's an active conversation that the Chief Executive, Will, Andy and I have been having recently to make sure that we provide, and I think this also um, talks to your last point, the right type of resource to bring the parties together to embed the relationship and those frameworks together so that we are engaging with our key stakeholders along the way in the planning process for infrastructure projects. So it becomes a slightly different model to what we've been doing and it, it does rely on the planning and engagement up front and seeing that then articulated all the way through to the delivery. 
of the project and then the reporting back through the ARF committee. So there's life cycle management associated with it and we are looking at the resources to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Foley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to Caroline for um, doing this great work and endeavouring to change the culture of an organisation, I'm sure, is an endearing feat. Um, and I, I just wanted to celebrate the end, um, as my colleague, um, Councillor Collard, has said that if we can help the small businesses in our district, um, that's, something, that's something that is quite transformational for them. Um, there are a number of barriers, and I'm, I'm not sure if you could answer the questions, Caroline, um, that interrelate with giving effect to this policy um, and the contractors that we can use. I'm not sure the cost of site-wise and how much of a barrier that is in terms of complying with the policy um, to even be considered. Uh, and um, number two, how we give an effect to this policy through our um, partnerships um, through for three borders and for the NTA uh, for Roni because they're our biggest dollar spends in terms of outcomes for our contractors at the end. So certainly, if I could take your second point first, um, thank you, Councillor Foy. Um, we are always looking at ways in which we can implement sustainable outcomes across current contracts that might be up for renewal and or uh, just fine-tuning as we go along with our current suppliers so that they are considering um, sustainable outcomes as part of you know, some of the maintenance work and what have you. It's not specifically, um, I guess, corralled into a program of work, but, but we have contracts coming up for renewal, some significant contracts, and we are already indicating to those contractors that if we are you know, going to, to pursue a relationship with them that um, sustainable outcomes will definitely form part of, part of that. And, and recognising that a lot of them are already doing this and um, this is not something new to them. But Glenn Raynham, who is in the room, is um, involved with the journey that we're on with his sustainable procurement from the Alliance's perspective. So he is well aware of um, and, and experienced in what we're trying to achieve there. Now, your first point was cost of site wise. <laughs> cost of site wise. Um, my understanding is that the cost is a barrier for some of our smaller contractors, absolutely. Um, and with some of the projects that we are working on in the um, NB funded space, we are using some of those fundings to help some of those contractors um, become site wise accredited. Will you? So, as you share, um, we have run a number of um, workshops. I think there's been 30 local suppliers that have attended them um, over the last few months that have given an instruction or given guidance around the process of becoming site-wise registered. Um, so, that's, that's been great engagement. We've also, on the um, website, we do have a link on the front page that points suppliers into guidance around working with council, so that gives opportunities for smaller suppliers to engage with council and engage with us. I think there is there are bottom lines in terms of ensuring that um, suppliers that we do bring on board do have appropriate health and safety systems, do have insurance in place, can write traffic management plans. Um, so there are there are bottom lines in the sand that we wouldn't want to cross, but we will and continue encouraging smaller suppliers to engage with us to help them get them on board and uh, you know, basically can do the work for us. Thank you, Councillor Finch. I'm going to call you Councillor Finch again. <laughs> I'm, I'm mindful that four councillors, three councillors, because I exclude myself from the debate and I'm chairing, uh, have not spoken, so I'm just going to ask my councillor usage. I'm very happy with it. Um, I'm, uh, over the months, it's evolved from social procurement to sustainable procurement, and it's looking good, so let's push on. Councillor Aldridge. Councillor Stephanie. Thank you. Chief Executive of the Floor. Just uh, to add to any that we put 18, supported 18 small to medium enterprises through site wise qualifications as of two weeks ago, which is a much more intimate support than we've ever kind of worked with them. But as Amy has said, there's some non negotiables for us about standards and safety and health duty legislation. Thank you. So there's been a robust debate on the 
item. So if there's no further debate, I will put the item sustainable procurement 6.10 as written in the agenda. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against no. Yeah. Thank you for your The next item on the agenda is 7.1 is we move into information report. My preference would have been that this went to infrastructure rather than council. It is where it is. The recommendation is that the report be received. I would actually like to change that and move that the report be referred to the infrastructure committee for their consideration. Can I a question, though? It's been moved and seconded. I now take a question. <laughs> Um, just around the, um, what's the word, uh, mediation with the Environment Court for the Taipa Wastewater Treatment Plant. Are they seeking any guidance from, any steer from Council on ele electrocoagulation and by a certain date? Um, two, two questions. Um, the first, the first, uh, the first comment around uh, why this report to Council requested by the mayor, um, so um, it felt appropriate to bring it to the full council and we're happy to be guided to take it to the infrastructure committee. Um, the second point regarding the uh, mediation around the type of wastewater treatment plant, then a copy of this report has been provided to um, the, uh, the type of Iwi and um, group who have um, appealed the decision. We don't need a full um, decision on, on the report for the council as a whole. We note that this work has been done uh, by GECA and uh, just the outcome of that was the um, type of mediation has been given a copy of this report. I just um, add, add some further clarification. Um, and I fully respect that John Carter is the mayor and he, in association with the chief executive, compiled the agenda. I am concerned that council agendas are becoming too large and too unwieldy. And elected members have a passionate interest in a number of items that come before us. But this is a council meeting, it is not a workshop. So the opportunity for you to participate in the kind of debate that you need to have on items such as standard edition and moxie power, which will appear later in the agenda, and things such as the transport strategy, do, in my humble opinion, do you need to go to the respective committees. And if an elected member is not on that committee but has a passionate interest in the matter at hand, our rules provide that they can attend those meetings. So having said that, I have moved that it be referred to the Infrastructure Committee. Would anybody else like to have the floor for the motion? I just want to say that, um, that the people at top are quite excited that this EEC technology is going to be used in the wastewater. Um, I think it, when that does happen, it will stop many, many years of frustration, particularly by the area out there. And, um, Bit worried about this being deferred. We should get on to it as soon as possible and get it done. Thank you, Councillor Village. I'll just clarify that this is an information only report. This is not an actionable report. So, having said that, it's been moved and seconded that it be referred to the infrastructure committee. Councillor Ford? Um, Madam, you just see that when it comes to the committee, please can the response from the uh, appellants. Please also be provided about the response to this report provided that would be helpful in terms of the consideration of the rest of the um, just clarifying with my staff that this report is one of the shared documents on the table with the type uh, negotiation the reports transparent shared and receiving the other feedback as part of the submission to the committee. Is that what you're asking for? Through the chair, um, it is unlikely that we will get any direct feedback in terms of this report. Um, as, as a single item, I think part of the mediation um, with the um, environment court will consider a number of technical documents, of which this is one, and if a certain can be reached 
um, without a further uh, commission direction, then, then that will be reported back to Council and the Infrastructure Committee, um, and um, the outcome of the appeal clearly will come back to, to Council. Okay, is there a question, Councillor? Um, yes, it would just be that um, as elected members, this is a, a, a hot topic, mm -hmm. and the staff won't provide the feedback from the public. I think we heard that they won't provide it. They just said it may not be available. So we'll leave that now to the Chief Executive and Mr. Finch, and this Thank will you. appear in the February infrastructure. Committee meeting. So I will now move the recommendation on page 93 that it be referred to the infrastructure. All those in favour say aye. Okay. Those against no. Carry. Thank you. Item 7.2, page 115 of the agenda program Darwin update. I will move the recommendation for the purpose of the debate. Can I have a second of me? Thank you, Councillor Busich. Mr. Finch is the authoriser of the report. Would you like to talk to the one Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Tony McCartney, um, who is sitting uh, to my right, who has been running Programme Darwin for a number of months. We'll be stepping away as a programme manager um, at the end of December. Um, so I will hand over to um, Tony to talk us through the, the key aspects of, of the report. Can you come up to the podium, please? The reason for that, I'm sure you're aware, you are being live streamed. Thank you. So look, I just want to take the report pretty much as read, but just highlight a couple of points that are in there. Um, the program itself, the Enterprise Asset Management Solution, is a, is a, is a comprehensive um, and long-running program of data information and understanding understanding for the um, for the council and its um, and the, and its community at large. Um, the program has been moving along reasonably slowly, I will say, um, pretty much due to distractions from. Um, you know, other demands on the business, um, and that's not surprising given that um, the knowledge and information that we require for the program is also required to run the business at the same time, so there's always that conflict going on there. Uh, the, um, uh, the program had a bit of a reset at the beginning of the year, which is pretty much where it sits now. It's on track for a, a pilot pr product, if you like, by June of next year. And, the, um, and then a working version by June the following year. They won't be comprehensive solutions, but they'll be tools that we'll be able to see and demonstrate in the competency of the program. Um, two, two other issues to highlight around um, risk and issues is in there. Um, clearly, there's a risk that um, there's an ongoing you know, risk around what we don't know as we as we progress the um, the program because as we're doing we're dealing with systems and data and technology here and the more we unravel the more we discover the more we've got to do and find things out so that's that's one risk there and the issue of course is the other one is around the ongoing resource commitment to the program and keeping people embedded and going in there in that vein um, just to let you know we've um, just launched a piece of work today with some of our key suppliers around their contribution to the data supply and how, what information they will be supplying and how they will do it. Um, and as the report uh, highlights, uh, we're also setting up a, um, a senior governance group across at, uh, at, at executive level to make sure that the issues around resourcing and or system development and demand are, are managed at, a, at, the, at, the, at the top level, so to speak, as opposed to running it at a program level. But that's just a quick pricey of what's in the report. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. I'll now open the floor to it. Uh, I beg your pardon. Councillor Busich is the second row. I'll go to you first and then I'll open the floor. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I support the project, Darwin. Obviously, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that it's a bit slow. So I'd like to um, probably others will ask that question as well. Uh, on page 2 of 11, you mentioned secondly, highlight and the risk associated with new and or improved information. I was surprised. I was surprised that that is a risk. I would have thought it was the other way around. That the risk of not knowing, you know, that what um, our assets are at, and that's the whole reason why we're doing it. Um, but as I said, I support it. Um, can you clarify what you mean by the risks here? I'm not... For example, um, as we do more condition work and assessment on the network, we'll, we may discover that the condition of their assets. Uh, 
less than or more, worse than what we expect them to be, in which case would change your financial demands upon how you need to put, set aside for in your money, which would then bring an issue back to the table here around how do you prioritise. So that's, that's an example of, all of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, those risks were always there, but it's good to know them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gustich. I didn't see all the hands go up over here, but um, I'm assuming it's all of you, so I'm going to start in the middle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for this report. It's really good to see the updates, um, especially the risk side of things. I just had a question on page 8 of 11 uh, in the traffic light performance reporting. Uh, communication plan in place by March 2020 is indicated as yellow. I was just wanting to get a bit of commentary around A, what a communication plan looks like in terms of in relation to the project, and B, what the meaning of the yellow is. So the, to answer the second question, firstly, well, yes, yellow is that it was meant, it has been in development since the start or the middle of the year when I came on board to do some of this work. It hasn't got to a to a published framework yet. Um, we still think we can get it to the timeline, but there is some anxiety through the team that we'll get there. And what we're talking about there is, as you saw in the report, um, we have re-emphasised the need for community at the end of one of the key work streams. The work streams were first set up before tended to have um, sort of very much internally focused. And the last work stream we've reset on this program is what, what does it look like to the community out there? So understanding what that is and how we go about communicating what will be a future state is what that communication plan is about. It's a starting point to go further with that. Great. Madam Chair, can I just ask for a further point of clarification? It does say in place by March 2020, which is why I asked about the yellow, because that is a past date, which I'm means sorry, that be, it wasn't in place. No. So is that a typo? Or it's is a typo. It? Okay, so Thank it's you. March 2021. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. I'm going to run out of chocolate fish at this point. Councillor Tiffany. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just saw page nine. Um, I don't know, the this, this, this sentence, I just would love to deconstruct the sentence um, the stated here under the Enterprise Asset Management Evolution. And it says there, um, the existing asset data, both documented and intuitive, is probably around 80% reliable, unsubstantiated estimate. So while it is credible enough for the development of the Antigen in the program, it isn't as robust as we would like to optimise individual asset decisions. I get that's why we... The data sticks. Down to <laughs> you know, It's probably around 80% reliable, but it's an unsubstantiated estimate, but it's also credible enough to support the development of our LTP. I just, yeah. when I read that, it's just... I was like, what the heck is this trying to tell me? And I knew what it was trying to tell me, but just the way I read it, it sounded good. Yes, it could have been made simpler. Um, I think the, the essence of that is, is that as assets, as the assets start and the suppliers know and operate the system a lot of the time, they've got a pretty good understanding of what the issues are. It's just not well documented and known. And there's and and it's in different places and different people's minds. So we've got to corral it together into one place and put it in there. So yes, take your your advice. I think it could be made simpler, but that's the essence of what we're saying. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Planter, did you have your hand up? I didn't see. No, I didn't. No, thank you. Apologies for my outburst. I'm not okay. And I was going to raise exactly what you yes. said about the data, you know, the information is in different places. And I, I just, um, you know, NTA's got some of it, our three waters have some of it. And I I, I am a little concerned about um, getting data from contractors. You know, we we own the asset, we um, wear the risk, we wear the cost if something has to be replaced or maintained. Um, so I, I think... Um, yeah, I'm a little bit. Um, I see that as a cost risk. You know, if if, a, if somebody's going to benefit from making upgrades to something, we need to make sure we're cross-checking that. Mm. Um, and we, I know from um, years back, there have been a lot of um, investigations into some of our infrastructure for different purposes, like the water, over years. So we do have a lot of intel 
in documents as we, as you mentioned before. So just making sure that it's cross assessed. Yeah. To yeah, make sure nobody's making gains yeah. off us. You know, if I could add to that's part of the journey that we're bringing the third party suppliers on, yep. or your suppliers on now, uh, Far North Waters and Rec Services, particularly to start with, which is your three waters and deep district facilities, mm -hmm. and there'll be other parties that come on board as well at the time. But it's a journey that they have to go on as well as, as us about getting information and putting it into one place. And that then does pose some challenges around how they store their data and how we store our data and how we talk to each other. But that's all part of the program. Yeah, but I guess I'm looking for some assurance that we're not just taking their data analysis on face value. No, no. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, this is what the, the enterprise solution's about, is they're trying to validate and cross-reference so that we're yep. confident with, with the answers that we're getting out of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Strachan. Councillor Paul. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have one question, and you've touched on it at the end there, and it was about the transfer of information and having the common platform. Um, both between the contractors and you've said the three waters and the um, recreational services, um, and then our asset managers and our staff, but then also the public um, using our GI system. So will this this and if I remember it correctly from when we procured the IT in for the system we've chosen will go across all of those facets, the same program with the contractors, with our staff, and then on the GIS system that the public can access. Is that correct or is that not correct? Yes and no. In4 is the engine room behind all of that. Mm -hmm. So basically what we're saying is that is the, is the, it is one source of the truth and one set of data. It can be represented in different ways depending on what audience is being, it's being seen by. So clearly there might be detail that the asset managers have around asset detail and competency, which we don't put into the public domain. It's more around a general detail. But it's, so, so yes, it's the same engine room, but it's how it's been, it can look different to different audiences. Thank you, sir. And Madam Chair, um, my question, so my question is when, pub, when the engine room is detailed with the information, as we're doing with our condition assessment, uh, and the contractors um, and putting that as they do the renewals, for example, the public will be able to see that in a GA system so that they know that they have the same yeah. type of data. Our maps were previous or recently updated only weeks ago, and one of them is a layer that shows the three waters, um, and it's a GIS just for the three waters. Is that, is that the, the, um, the maps that will be updated with this info? So that the info would be the source of the engines, would be the data that would be presented up and put into that graphical format that they see. And it's the information that's come from the suppliers. Thank you, Councillor Board. Councillor Pollard and Councillor Rabbit, you do, do you wish to? No? Thank you very much. It's been um, interesting. Mm -hmm. So we've had a good debate on item 7.2. I'm now going to put the recommendation on page 115. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Uh, item 7.3 was the recommendation review cost. The recommendation on page 127 is that the report be received. I'll move it for the purposes of the debate. Can you have a second, please? Yep. Thank you, Councillor This was a report that was requested by inclusion. The media. Um, I'm not sure if anybody uh, has got any questions on it. It's straightforward, but Caroline is here. If anybody does, so I'll now open the floor. Councillor Tikia. Okay. I, I just, just purely out of curiosity, what is the population certificate and why does it cost a grant? I would have to ask Dale Lipsowski, but when we, um, it, it's to do with how we, you know, get our population yeah. statistics to be able to do effectively um, get our communities um, squared away in terms of communities and interests in that plus or minus role. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, I don't actually have the answer to, as yeah. to why it costs a thousand dollars. It's quite interesting because it's almost done steps into yeah. so the mesh box and Count might be doing that because that boundary is different. You know, the government can't be every single little wish box. That's one I leave to the technical expertise. <laughs> if I could just offer something, I suspect it's because there's a, for a poll, it must be X percent of a population, so that's a verification of what the number is that you need 10 percent of whatever. 5 percent, yeah. Okay. 
What was the thousand dollars is a mystery. Yeah. Are there any other questions on the Do you think this report is necessary? Sorry? Do you think this report is necessary? Because it costs a lot. Well, we think, uh, we it's a legal requirement. It is a legal requirement, is it? Yeah. What? Thank you, Councillor Radish, as I explained, this report was requested by the Mayor and it is in response to a statutory process which Councillor Radish would like to do. Yes. Right. Thank you. Are there any other questions of Caroline? If not, I'll put the motion all in favour say aye. Thank you. Now have items before we move into public exclusion. Seven point four on page one three zero. I will move the people of the debate to make the decision. Yep. Um, I didn't send out an email because I, my observation is that you can go like a gap and go and get about fifty thousand questions in five minutes if you want to mind. So I did ask everybody in the set of questions to send them to the CEO and offer, and I hope you all took advantage of that opportunity to do so. Uh, I'm now going to pass over to Sean to give us the talk in his report. Um, Chair, the report I take as soon as is read, but I would just characterise the period of um, September, October as being uh, culmination of a host of quite long-term running projects, which is really satisfying to us. And I just want to share that with you because I'm, I'm hoping elected members get satisfaction out of this too. Um, I've said before that our council has been brave enough to commit to the longer gestation projects, and they take a lot of patience from the public and from the elected members because the winds aren't necessarily all that obvious in the first half of the projects. It's easy to do the flashy stuff. Um, but really sometimes that's superficial. So in terms of re-engineering the council over the last few years, uh, council mark obviously didn't happen in this eight weeks period, but it happened in the week following. Certainly all the work that was going to be done was culminating in this two month period. And, and that marks for us the end of the three and a half year phase or episode of installing capabilities that an organisation should have and this one didn't. And we've all worked together variously on those. So that's. I mean, a big sigh of relief for staff and myself and hopefully for you that we did 34 change projects, most of which are now complete. The judges have been through, and I just know the um, you know, really cool, actually, collaboration that went on between elected members and staff. Without lying to the judges, we were as transparent on our warts and all account of what we were, but it's done. They um, and walked away commenting on just how clear <coughs> we were with elected members. That was a comment I wasn't looking for or expecting, but it was a real compliment to you and elected members and staff, and then staff with staff. So. That was the first big achievement. The second is that we got our second big day two together, which in terms of cultural realignment is a, is a big commitment from our council and from our public because we essentially shut down a lot of discretionary services for a day while we get people on buses and bring them to um, the Turner Centre. So that was a good rally for the group on the unifying um, causes. Uh, the, Thirdly, that a lot of work has been done on remote working, not because we chose to, but we are proud amongst all councils for what we collectively again as governments and ops managed to achieve in terms of remote working. And um, during this period, we saw national recognition through the Elgin Awards, through both the supportive team uh, category and the fast track project category, saw so a second and third, but the winners of those categories being a big. Auckland Council and Auckland Transport, there we were um, on the podium with them. So, great piece of work by all of us and recognised at national level again. Fourth, um, your voice survey culminated. So, it takes takes a year of time to satisfy your troops before you finally get a report that says 12 out of 13 areas asked about, about whether they're getting adequate leadership, adequate training, job satisfaction, and the like. Um, to get that sort of response is great. 
we did get 79 pages of comments and there's quite honest feedback in there that's not a wet flash. So it's an active program, but again, that was um, that also happened in the pending period. Building consents accreditation, I think that's five or six. Um, two year program uh, under Dr. Dean Myberg and a wrap around of all the other groups. And I think you have be probably more with that story now, but to get such such an outstanding pass, and we'll see you in two years from NBN Irons. Um, it's also a great deliverable for the period. Seven resource consents uh, got 100% delivery, and we haven't been there since I've been in this council. Uh, it's now five out of six weeks running, we've been delivering 100% compliance on resource consents turnaround. So that was achieved in the period. Year and a half of negotiation with Avita, culminated in the sign. Um, two, year, two and a half years of lobbying other councils to get a regional approach to economic development, albeit without Whangarei, but that was uh, brought back to you for a second time to make sure that without Whangarei in, we were still happy to sign off. So that, that's a massive sigh of relief as well, with big prospects now going forward. We opened the Hormonga, I can throw that in slightly miscellaneous, but that's again another long term project that we were, was complex for us and which is now delivered. And in the admin side, uh, just noting that limbs online, you know, it takes two and a half years to digitise your property files. That was complicated too, but we got there and now we're starting to see real fruit where you can get all this, um, get this data online as a customer. So I don't know what, maybe there's 10 or 11 points all up, but it is actually quite phenomenal that they all culminated within an eight week period. And for our trips, what that means is, whilst we're flat out on stuff, like we've been discussing today as we go to Christmas, the back of it's been broken, the back of quite a long period of investment has been broken. There's an exciting new conversation now, which we need your, your input on, about a phase two for our council. And what a narrow down scope post council mark looks like in order to now touch the customer. It's all about outreach and secondly how to get internal coherence between these new capabilities that we've got in council. So a fresh new conversation with SLT and we'll try and put material in front of you as soon as we can. Very satisfying period, but I'm sure you've got lots of points that you would like to raise up in the positive and negative and really taking your questions. Thank you, John. Uh, now I think it's a good question, but I would just remind elected members that it is 20 past two and we have an extensive public excluder. Um, so I'm not trying to put the brakes on you, but I'm going to have to be quite strict on time, but we're not going to get through the business. So let's go with Councillor Tipanea. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. I did think that this was worthy of mentioning to in the example of our new wastewater treatment plant uh, on page 176. Um, I just want to acknowledge that um, at a meeting we had with Te Mori or Te Wai, we were actually wanting a preferred option for the wastewater treatment plant to align with our long-term plan, and they told us that that just that that could not happen. And I just really want to acknowledge that we, as the council, and have, have agreed to that, and that it's going to have a special consultative procedure to allow this community to actually have the same. Time and time again in council, I hear about how our communication and feedback with community groups and with hapu groups as well falls over, and, and I just really like pulled this highlight for me out of um, the CE's report that, wow, well, actually, do you know what? We've got ears open in this regard, and, and it doesn't align with how we want it to, but we're going to do something else to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on page 145, um, there's strategy development bylaws and policies. The top of the page is FN 2100, district strategy. Um, I did anticipate that, that that would come to this council meeting, but we haven't yet had an update about that. Can we have a verbal update about the progress of that and when we're likely to see that piece of paper? Thank you. For uh, Gia, um, there is a workshop scheduled for, I want to say, the 3rd of February. We'll be bringing the, the draft.
draft FM 2100 strategy to that workshop. Uh, that will be the consultation document, and then we will we're planning to consult on FM 2100 at the same time as the long term plan, so in March. So I, I would expect the February Council meeting to adopt full consultation draft. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor McLean, you had signalled that I bypassed your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Not for the essence of it. Yeah, I was just curious in terms of salary staffing. Um, we've got a potential establishment number 377. Actually, about 30 below that. But the year to date triggers are sort of aligned with budget. I, was, I just wanted to see if our our salaries budget would equate to that higher figure, the, the potential staff numbers, or in fact it's marginally um, above that. Can you just give us the page, Councillor? Oh, I'm sorry, 137, yeah. The, the, the actual and the budget and salaries are very close within a few thousand dollars, despite the fact that we are 30 staff down on our, what we could conceivably have. Yeah, look, I think it's a reasonable question. I've, I've got Mike representing Jill Coyle here. Mike, we can give you an opportunity, and Janice also. Are you able to speak to this? Um, I don't have those details. Did you need to come up to Sean? Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Mike, we just need to open the streaming. Sorry, Thank, thanks, Mike. Uh, I see Janice doesn't have anything to add. Do you mind if we take that on advice? Because I think that's actually quite a good question, and I wouldn't mind bringing it back to, to your council members. Sure, everybody's being paid. That's the main thing. So, yeah, that's, no, that's a good point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McClendon. Anybody else got any questions for the Chief Executive on the paper? Highlights um, on page 63 or 191 of the um, agenda. JC Park, um, the Liberty Swing um, that's been referred to in our park um, is going to be opening on the 18th of December, which is from midweek. So, this will be the first one of its kind in the Arnold District. So, I just want to thank the staff member who actually suggested this and went all out to have this.
sluggish. <laughs> we just need to make sure that what yeah. you're saying. No, that's right. Okay, right. so we have yeah. the report stays in PX. Thanks. I just like to close where I started today and just acknowledge what an incredibly challenging year it has been with the crises uh, and COVID and um, I just I know we've still got some workshops next week, so this is not a way to have a wonderful Christmas. But for those who we don't get to see again. Please have a wonderful Christmas. Take time to recharge your batteries. Reconnect with friends and family. Be stuck. Because next year the pressure's on again. And we will not let up. And we love you all. Drive safe and be careful. Thank you. Uh,